look into you, you can start planning how can actually that uh, that um, have the impact in terms of <coughs> your operation and maintenance can have impact on your um, that impact in uh, environmental as well as uh, social and economics. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So these are basically um, uh, the framework, okay, uh, focusing on the five P's, okay, uh, people, planet, prosperity, product, and process, okay. Um, uh, we have actually uh, five categories, uh, which is product impact, uh, process impact, people impact, uh, planet impact, as well as prosperity impact. So what I will go through um, in uh, that in the subsequent slide, is actually to touch some of the um, elements, okay, uh, under the people, planet, and prosperity, to actually... Um, uh, give you some um, highlight about what we as engineer ataupun you being a new engineer can actually uh, provide some of the impact in, in a small way. Next slide please. So this um, framework basically also aligned with the United Nations Global Compact uh, 10 principle. It's also aligned with United Nations Global Reporting Initiative and I'm sure that you also have uh, learned about SDG, okay, it's also uh, aligned with Sustainable Development Goal, the SDG 17, okay, um, and uh, I'm sure also that uh, part of your class uh, in EIS, okay, uh, Engineers in Society, that you actually will uh, go through uh, this uh, Sustainable Development uh, Initiative, and how can you uh, as engineer contribute uh, towards this uh, SDG 17. Next slide, please. So there are basically uh, the uh, categories and uh, some of the elements. Okay, I will actually uh, run through uh, the people, uh, planet, and property. Give you some example and also highlight that uh, you as an engineer, okay, uh, as a young engineer, how can you actually play a role? Uh, yeah, could be a small role, but actually will have uh, a long term, a big impact. Next slide. Firstly, you look into uh, on the um, on the uh, people uh, or social impact. Uh, on labor practices and decent work, okay. This basically aligned with uh, SDG uh, eight, which is um, uh, which is a uh, social and uh, um, economic growth, okay. And um, in terms of uh, labor practices, uh, you look into uh, staffing, okay. How can actually you achieve uh, better productivity in the in the staff, right? okay? One area that you want to actually increase the productivity is um, on in terms of motivation. So as a young engineer, you can basically uh, motivate uh, the workers. You can basically um, uh, talk to them uh, in a, a motivational way. And uh, these are things which you need to learn uh, in the, when you're in university, how to actually address uh, the people. Because when you go to work, you're going to have a different age group of people. Okay, You will be going out at the age of 23, 24. Okay? Um, and uh, you'll be addressing someone, people who are actually in the mid-30s, uh, mid 40s and some of them also in mid 50s. Uh, so these are things where you need to actually learn uh, some of the way how to approach, how to actually talk to them, how to ensure that when you actually uh, talk to them, you are not uh, demotivating them. You are basically encouraging them to actually uh, perform better. Because once uh, people are happy working uh, in the environment, they actually increase their productivity. These are things which you need to actually develop a positive work environment. Uh, and when you have that positive work environment, you actually reduce certain work. So when you reduce the turnover, you actually basically ensure that the company uh, uh, able to operate at a lower cost because of you do, you actually minimize any recruitment as well as you uh, minimize the training. So people who are actually uh, being on uh, in the work for a longer period, they are actually more skillful. Jadi based on the skill uh, skill uh, level, they actually perform better. Jadi benar-benar macam ni is doable. Yeah, as a young engineer, you can basically do. It's not something that uh, rocket sign that you need to actually uh, do or something that is uh, not un not achievable. It's something that you just need to be able to talk to them to make sure that you actually create a positive environment, which is doable for a young engineer or fresh engineer like you, uh, where in the in the problem in the industry. Okay, next slide, please. Next, you actually look into the project health and safety. This is one of the area uh, where I think you also learn about uh, environmental safety and health uh, that subject uh, in the UC. And uh, something that you need to actually ensure that um, you will need to have a safe and secure place. Okay, how can you actually um, ensure that the workplace actually is uh, is safe okay, uh, and uh, secure? Um, let me give you one example, which is also doable. Is uh, Number one, actually, is... Uh, um, looking into housekeeping. That is very important at the end of each project, at the end of the day, that you need to ensure that you encourage the 
the workers, you encourage the staff that you need to do proper housekeeping. Especially kalau dekat project site, you have a lot of um, people actually eat at site. Okay, when people eat at site, uh, what will happen is that uh, they will actually, uh, sometimes they just dispose the the, the food waste uh, indiscriminately. They, they campak kata-kata. They don't actually uh, um, collect into one place. You don't have uh, proper uh, bin to dispose. So this actually will encourage rodent, will encourage uh, tikus, uh, uh, red uh, to come. and uh, So when red comes, what next will come? Snake. Because uh, basically, uh, when you actually have uh, red in your work site or the workplace, uh, eventually you're going to have snake. So when the snake comes, actually it's going to be uh, a health hazard uh, to the people, a safety hazard. Eh? That is, sometimes people get uh, bitten by snake. There are cases um, at the job site, uh, ataupun construction site, uh, people basically be hospitalized because of bitten by snake. So these are things which um, uh, uh, health and safety um, things that you as engineer, young engineer, you can do it. Yeah, tak ada, orang kata tak ada masalah that for you to say I need actually have a lot of uh, um, uh, budget uh, to to uh, to execute this I need to actually ensure that uh, things are basically uh, um, be done I need management support I need a lot of things which you as a young engineer is manageable you can actually do it uh, uh, at this place so uh, what actually will impact kalau katakan the uh, um, the safety uh, uh, been jeopardized this basically can cause uh, lost time injury uh, lost time injury people actually get injured and because of that, you actually also can uh, uh, stop work and so on. Yeah, let me share you an uh, example. Um, um, I'm sure that, um, I think well, sometime in 2021, you, uh, 2020, sorry, uh, you heard about the big explosion in Pengerang. It's actually a refinery down south uh, Johor in Pengerang. Uh, there's a big explosion which caused six people actually died from that uh, explosion fire. Okay, um, Obviously, call uh, call upon to actually do investigation. Okay, I spent about uh, four five months to do uh, investigation, uh, engaged by third party, and uh, we also dosh uh, Department of Capital Safety and Health, atau uh, JKP, also came over to do uh, investigation and so on. And writing from that um, investigation, uh, it caused uh, pengerang to actually stop operation more than one half years, more than eighteen months. They stop operation. So this is where it gave me a lot of um, economic impact. Just because of um, the safety aspect has uh, not been uh, uh, properly put in place, and uh, which caused uh, big explosion and fire arising in um, uh, in a company will actually need to pay some penalty. Okay, uh, the six person died. Okay, they've been uh, compensated. Uh, Petronas had to pay uh, the families of this uh, uh, the deceased um, uh, person, and also have to pay a fine. And I think the very importantly actually is that uh, they need to stop operation. Okay, uh, for the case of Petronas uh, Pengerang, uh, one day operation is equivalent to something like um, more than 2 million uh, worth of income. Just imagine if you are talking about uh, 700 days of out of service, so you just multiply, it's cost billion uh, for, the, uh, for this operation. Okay? Just because of um, you have actually impact on safety. Jadi, um, as young engineer, we can actually play a role uh, in a small way uh, to ensure that uh, the place are basically uh, uh, kept. Especially when the, uh, there's a lot of um, things lying around, you can actually have tripping hazard, you can actually have fire situation, and uh, this is uh, something that uh, the, uh, that are yeah, doable for you. Okay, next slide, please. Next, we look into uh, training education. Um, kalau we look into, we want to improve on productivity, we need to actually then uh, to, uh, stress on skills skill set people have to be competent jadi when people have to be competent similarly so when you go into the job market you also need to actually improve on your skill you need to improve on your competency so you also need to actually be trained uh, training here actually uh, there's many aspects of training you can actually do is that one is that currently you are actually been uh, trained in the UST in order for you to to get the the basic uh, qualification or basic understanding about what actually entails in the in the future uh, secondly, you need to actually go into the uh, on-job training. Okay, you learn as you as you work. And thirdly, you go into formal training where you've been uh, sent uh, to some uh, training uh, uh, institute for you to actually learn. Okay, uh, overall actually is uh, to ensure that uh, you can actually able to improve the pr uh, productivity, efficiency as well as your creativity. Similarly, also uh, you need to actually look into the people we need to. Okay, the workers and then the technician and, and, and so forth and how you want to actually improve the skill that you may need to actually Either you actually conduct training for them, okay, you need to, for them to improve the skill, ataupun uh, they got to actually go to a, um, a formal or external uh, training. 
Jadi uh, some of the activities that you yourself uh, as a young engineer can uh, uh, can contribute in terms of training is that to look into the power of analysis. I think we engineers kita learn a lot of uh, the power of analysis on problem solving. Uh, we learn how to actually uh, solve problem. Okay, how to actually the method to 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 solve problem. So this I think which you can actually uh, um, teach the the technician, the workers to say that how can actually uh, use your capacity in terms of problem solving to actually um, solve uh, some of the uh, side issues. Eh? So this, the, uh, with this, you can actually improve the performance of the uh, workers in terms of they can actually uh, troubleshoot themselves and they can actually be able to uh, to address the um, uh, the problem uh, right away uh, without any intervention from uh, from high level. Okay. Next slide, please. And um, another area that uh, we look into this uh, accessibility impact uh, then is also on local competence development. So this is where um, sometimes when you involve in project, you actually move from one place to another place. When you actually work, in, let's say um, you are based in uh, in Kuala Lumpur, okay, you have actually a, a job in in Alustar Kedah. So one of the area that you also need to look into is that how to actually um, develop local talent. You need to, because it's uh, going to be very costly, going to be very expensive, you want to actually bring some of the uh, people uh, from uh, Kuala Lumpur, you need to actually bring them. So once you actually bring these people from uh, Kuala Lumpur up there, not only that you need to actually, uh, it costs a uh, transportation cost, but also cost uh, logic. Uh, you need to actually house them in um, in hotel or homestay, that's why it costs money. Tapi another alternative actually to look into uh, local, local people who actually can support you in some of the activities, in mana, um, these uh, local people can uh, basically uh, can, uh, work from home, okay, ataupun uh, they can actually commute from uh, from home and they can actually uh, give you the support. Uh, so one of the area that uh, you can actually contribute or you can actually play as a young engineer is that uh, when you drop a plan for uh, project management to see what are the activities that you need to actually have the key personnel that you need to actually bring up from the from the home office, okay, katakan from KL. Okay, what are the, the some of the personnel, like the helpers, the apa, the semi-skilled uh, workers, you can basically uh, get from uh, from local. And at the same time, you also support the, uh, the local community in terms of the economic. Okay. Uh, next, please. Uh, the other area, actually, you look into uh, community support. Uh, I, actually, I mentioned that uh, tadi, kalau apa, first you look into the employment of these uh, people from the community. Secondly, uh, other areas that you can... You can support them actually is that um, if you need to actually uh, consume uh, food, you need to actually consume uh, uh, materials from for the uh, uh, for your project. Um, it's also ideal for you to actually to, uh, to get local. Okay, the reason also uh, when you support this um, uh, community, uh, then, uh, you're buying from local. Uh, not only that you are um, supporting uh, these uh, people, uh, the economic of the community, but you also support in terms of the uh, carbon emission. I just imagine kalau you want to order some of the spare parts, you got to actually bring from KL, travel all the way to uh, Alustar. Then that basically uh, has to go either by by lorry ataupun uh, by bus ataupun by apa, you you put in a parcel eh, in the bus ataupun uh, you someone has to drive uh, to uh, to Alustar. So that basically is um, carbon emission uh, for this uh, uh, for this item uh, that you want uh, want to place order. Instead, you can actually go to the local uh, hardware shop ataupun you can go to the local uh, supplier to get. Because these people definitely, yes, they are bringing uh, this item also through lorry ataupun other uh, public transport, but they bring it back. So basically, they, they actually improve in terms of uh, the carbon emission. Then this again, um, as I mentioned earlier, is that um, uh, one area that uh, you can support directly is to minimize uh, carbon emission. Jadi, kalau you minimize in terms of the logistic, you can also uh, help in terms of uh, carbon emission. And other area basically is that you need to also improve on your relationship with the community because um, this is part of the license to operate. You are actually uh, going into um, a community where you actually are going to run a project and uh, sometimes uh, if you are uh, uh, causing any disturbance to the community, uh, the community basically can actually report to the authority and that basically be jeopardize your project. Uh, again, I always, uh, I always tell to young people eh, that uh, it's just like uh, when you have a girlfriend. Okay? Bila you have a girlfriend, if the girlfriend, if the girl likes you, okay, it talks a little everything. Uh, whatever you do, it, it doesn't matter. You will actually, the, the girl actually will uh, able to tolerate. 
Tapi just imagine eh, your, your ex-girlfriend eh, ataupun where you you fought with her. Lepas tu nanti whatever you do, even you do something good also, they actually, misal, they look into a very negative aspect because of the person that decide. Jadi sama juga dengan community. Kalau the community likes you, sometimes certain things, sometimes you may release some apa, black smoke atau you may actually be a bit noisy sometimes project side kita apa, kita be noisy. Kalau kita apa, uh, good with the community, they will actually tolerate. Okay, they able to actually uh, able to to receive some of the Uh, a bit of disturbance. Tapi kalau katakan uh, you are not uh, apa, in good contact with community, the community dislike you, then everything, the slightest uh, apa, mistake you do, they can actually uh, report to authority. Uh, you just apa, have um, a bit noise, then they can report, okay, uh, the job site or the project site is very noisy. No? Jadi, this again, uh, you just have to picture yourself that you actually, if you have someone that uh, likes you, whatever you do, Ha, you you basically uh, you know, uh, apa, um, people tolerate you. Uh, so sama juga when you actually uh, get involved in the project, um, the community you need to actually get involved in the community. Uh, jadi getting involved in the community there's a lot of way. Right? As a young engineer, you can always participate in some of the uh, community support as a services uh, and, and so on. And you can actually you don't need to flash money. You don't need to actually apa, uh, sponsor big events and so on. Simply you can just be with uh, with them and be part of the apa, the activities. It's good enough for them to actually recognize. Your contribution towards that, uh, that, uh, um, that community. Okay, next slide, please. <coughs> and again, um, while you're also looking into the you know, the health and safety of the uh, you know, uh, of the workers, okay, of your uh, staff, you also need to actually look into the uh, customer and uh, out upon your community uh, health and safety. And safety. Uh, for instance, like you have to minimize the risk uh, complaint. Sama juga, I mentioned, kalau you don't actually Uh, do housekeeping on the food waste uh, of the, uh, the workers, which you can eventually you can actually have snake, and the snake may end up going to the neighbor's uh, house. So the neighbors complain where the, the where this snake comes from. They say oh from the job site. So basically, um, you will be reported to the authority, and authority will come and do uh, that, uh, that, um, investigation. Sometimes you can also have um, with the housekeeping. If you don't take care, sometimes the food uh, not only the food waste, you also have this. Uh, Uh, the packed uh, food where it can also uh, uh, subject to uh, rainwater. So when rainwater, then you are talking about mosquito breeding. When you have mosquito breeding, you actually uh, may have uh, Aedes mosquito and that actually can lead to dengue outbreak. So not only dengue outbreak can actually happen in your job site, can also happen in the community. Rising from uh, the project activity that you do. So benda macam ni is that uh, is doable. You can actually do. You just, uh, as a young engineer, you can basically ensure that uh, you Uh, you have um, safe uh, workplace ataupun clean workplace uh, to actually prevent all this uh, prevent from apa, um, infection of uh, snake ataupun um, uh, mosquito okay, breeding place. Next. And uh, on human rights, uh, basically, um, you also need to actually understand about the uh, Uh, the uh, the labor law okay you need to actually ensure that uh, you have a issue uh, that um, uh, that minor then um, because sometimes when you go to site um, you may have a situation whereby um, the father got a job and say okay can I bring my son, my son which is out of school and then to to help out to do work and so on and then you need to actually also ensure that uh, they are basically of a legal age okay in Malaysia the legal age uh, is 14 years old you can actually work uh, however If the job actually is hazardous, okay, especially when we do construction activities, these are basically considered as hazardous job. The minimum age is 16. So this you need to actually uh, understand that uh, if you need that, uh, sometimes you have uh, little kid uh, coming out to help their parents um, uh, to do some of the uh, work site activities and so on. And if they are basically uh, under the age of 16, they're basically illegal. Any injury happen on site, then you can actually be liable because you're allowing a minor to work on site. So these are things which. Um, you need to also understand that um, being a project engineer uh, on site, you need to ensure that um, uh, your workers are basically of uh, legal age. Okay, next slide. And uh, the other area actually is on voluntary, on, uh, voluntary labor, human rights. Okay, uh, di sini kalau kita lihat di sini, uh, apa, you will see that there's no slavery anymore in uh, apa. Uh, I would say that uh, in Malaysia, and sometimes um, people say that I don't actually engage uh, um, forced labor and so on. Uh, it can be as simple as that uh, you have actually a project site, 
and you have Kongsi. I mean, uh, Mr. Sam, you know that uh, Kongsi basically is the, the, the accommodation which you house uh, sometimes foreign uh, workers ataupun um, uh, workers from the same, I mean, in Malaysia, Malaysia workers, tapi you place them in a in camp close to the job site. Okay, uh, so that is very quite common because you want to actually make sure that uh, the cost basically kept low, that they don't have to stay uh, in uh, uh, in a homestay ataupun in a hotel. Uh, you can actually, you, you build a kongsi and they don't need to actually travel in a bus ataupun, uh, apa, they need to, you need to ferry them uh, to workplace because they are basically inside the workplace. Okay, when you say that these people are forced labor, okay, when um, these people who actually stay in this kongsi ataupun in this uh, camp, they are not able to actually go out freely. Okay, you prevent them from going out to actually go to uh, to the town. Okay, I say the work basically is uh, outskirt of um, uh, of uh, what is it? Um, Alustar, for instance. Okay, a bit uh, a bit far away, and then uh, and you don't allow them to actually go to town. Okay, you say that you are, the the not they only need to stay uh, uh, on site, and you actually provide them food. You provide them with all the uh, amenities and so on. So they are not able to go out. So if this happen then you consider as uh, the people are working in a detention camp. So when detention camp, that's where uh, you actually have violated on the human right. Uh, this is there, if you read uh, some of the story that uh, uh, Malaysia Palm Oil, uh, ataupun uh, sebelum tu, you also have this uh, Malaysian glove. Uh, so top glove is been, uh, it's, uh, it's been taken that they basically have engaged a uh, forced labor. They've done uh, under the forced labor because they have violated the human right. Okay, one of the issue is is not to say that they actually uh, kidnap someone to bring to the job site and actually of the uh, put into um, into the area where uh, they force them to actually do work and so on out of their free will. Okay, it's not that the case, but it's just simple as uh, for the case of top club, they brought uh, brought in a lot of foreigners, people from um, uh, from Myanmar and then from uh, Cambodia as well from Vietnam, and then they put them into um, into hostel, and they don't allow these people to actually leave hostel. They don't allow to go out. So that basically is be treated as uh, a detention camp. So when it's a camp, then you are talking about you violated the human rights. So uh, as engineer, you need to actually uh, be uh, be uh, watchful of that. Okay, you may fall into uh, violating the human rights just because you are trying to actually say we don't want the workers to be exposed because of uh, when they expose outside, then somebody else offer them a better pay, they just run away or they just leave the job site. So you lose you lose workers. You say that I want to just keep them inside the camp, don't allow them to go out. So that basically is uh, the concept of detention and you are letting the human right. Okay. Next slide, please. And that area actually is ethical uh, behavior. Okay, when talking about ethical behavior here is that uh, you look into, um, then we are talking about also uh, corruption or bribery practice. Okay, this is where uh, sometimes when you um, look into this uh, situation, you actually, of course, uh, some, um, it costs money to actually uh, practice that and because of that sometimes uh, what the company will do is that they try to cut corners they try to actually um, manage the uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, practices uh, um, inferior product and so on uh, being used and secondly also you look into the um, reduce waste this way basically you look into how to reuse re repurpose and recycle and uh, within your uh, level of then you can actually look into it okay as it can be as simple as uh, Recycle paper. Okay, you can actually just use that. If you want to uh, write something, you don't have to get uh, a fresh uh, A4 size paper. You just actually use uh, use uh, printed paper. Okay, uh, the back part, uh, the back area uh, of the paper, you can use it. Okay, you can also look into um, recycle. Okay, uh, some of the materials uh, that you can look into how can uh, you recycle. And you can also look into how to repurpose. Okay, uh, what area is that? I think the biggest... Um, uh, concern now actually is single-use plastic bottle. I think I'm sure that uh, even in university, you'll have that single-use plastic bottle when you buy the uh, 500 ml uh, uh, plastic bottle. After drinking, you just dispose it. Okay, so this is something which I think one of the uh, biggest uh, challenge to most of the the, the corporation as well as uh, even in university. Uh, so this is the area where you can look into how to repurpose. Okay, they are basically. Um, uh, company are doing eco brick. Okay, um, you can basically browse through uh, eco brick. They have actually a, a place in uh, um, somewhere in a PJ area. Okay, my friend is operating that uh, eco brick uh, center. And then, if you want to actually pay a visit, you can actually uh, feel free. You can actually visit and see how they they actually look into uh, recycle the single waste, uh, single use uh, plastic bottle. Okay, these are something that 
you can uh, learn and you can actually do that. Because the minute that you can actually um, reuse, repurpose, or recycle um, waste material, or at at use uh, spent material, they're not going to be any waste. Okay, so um, I remember that uh, when I was a kid, we have a lot of um, metal waste in construction site. We have a lot of metal waste uh, even uh, at the roadside and so on. Okay, because of um, they can recycle uh, metals. Okay, there's a lot of value in the recycling of uh, metal. Now you hardly you see uh, uh, recycle. Uh, but you hardly you see metal. Even the can of drinks. Okay, the plastic bottle. Yes, you can find in the dustbin, but you are not able to find the the, um, the aluminium can drink uh, because of uh, people actually collect it and uh, recycle it. So then, if they, you you can find um, a purpose for recycling or re, uh, to reuse. Uh, you're not going to have any waste. So in the project side, similarly, you know, need to look into how can you minimize uh, waste uh, in order for you to improve the overall um, project uh, profit. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned uh, Zan, uh, briefly just now on uh, anti-corruption, uh, how to eliminate uh, bribery and corruption. Because this is where uh, if you practice um, uh, corruption in your project, okay, um, Normal practice is that you you are basically uh, putting a cost to a project. Okay, when you have a cost to the project, you also have actually put in every uh, element. And in order to be uh, effective or competitive, you are actually looking to how can you actually minimize the design, uh, how can you actually have a uh, most lean uh, uh, costing in order to the project. And not many people, I have not come across a company who actually they uh, put uh, cost in uh, corruption or uh, bribery as part of their project costing. And normally project costing, you look into the manpower cost, you think about the material cost, the consumable cost, the machinery cost, and, and many other costs you, you put in. But you don't put actually uh, part of the cost basically bribery or the corruption cost inside your project costing. Daddy, there, there's no costing actually built in inside that project cost. But if you're actually going to, going to practice uh, bribery or you're going to practice uh, this corruption, you can actually take some of the cost out from the the initial costing that you actually put in, either the material cost or the, uh, the manpower cost. And then when the, you, you are taking up this cost, what happen? You will need, you cannot actually purchase the, the right material because of you already taken up the, the budget out of it. So what you do is that people tend to actually give inferior project. project. Katakan kalau the material is supposed to cost 100 ringgit, uh, so when you do costing, tapi because of you have taken 40 ringgit for, bribe, uh, for corruption, so the material you only have about 60 ringgit. So what happens if you buy a 60 ringgit material versus original intention to buy a 100 ringgit material? So the, the material definitely be going to be less uh, less uh, quality, going to be inferior. And then you are going to build in uh, less inferior into your project. This is where you are talking about uh, ethical behavior. You are going to actually have the project which are supposedly to actually have a stainless steel 316, tapi you put stainless steel 304, which is less superior and uh, less durable. Uh, stainless steel material and that going to actually impact the the project uh, quality and so on. Benda-benda ni, uh, as an design engineer, kita boleh practice. We can do. Not to say that uh, something which is uh, that we are not apa, we are not able to actually uh, to, uh, put in uh, this item. Sama juga, when you actually uh, on the manpower, kalau katakan uh, quite similar, if you are taken out about uh, a lot of uh, costing on this uh, corruption, then you cannot engage skillful people because skill, skillful people sometimes you have to pay sometimes like uh, kata 200 ringgit satu hari. Tapi because of you've taken out the money, you can only afford to actually pay something 120 ringgit. So where 120 ringgit, you are not getting a skill, highly skillful people, you're getting a less skillful and that's high, less skillful will actually produce a uh, less uh, quality ataupun uh, poor quality uh, outcome. Benda macam ni, you will actually at the end of the day result, sometimes you see that um, Building just uh, completed, then you, you can see crack, uh, uh, crack. You can see actually if uh, um, it's not been done uh, properly, uh, and, and so on and so on. Okay, next slide, please. Fair competition here actually is that um, you look into how can you um, compete, okay, um, and uh, you basically uh, look into on the fairness, okay, uh, when you basically need to engage a subcontractor, okay, when you begin to actually uh, look into. Uh, how can you actually have a fair uh, practices to ensure that everybody able to actually compete equally and everybody able to actually uh, participate uh, on their best um, uh, quality deliverables. Okay. So this is something that um, uh, sometimes when you actually manage a project, you need to actually um, 
award some projects, uh, award uh, to the subcontractor. Okay, when you award to the subcontractor, um, if you actually look into a uh, fair competition, this is you also making um, your com your company actually be competitive. Because uh, if you don't do that, then you basically this is where sometimes uh, you learn about a pencil which cost something eighty ringgit. Eh? I think I'm sure that you have read uh, in the newspaper. Okay, some of the supplier instead of uh, Three ringgit pencil is they supply to company at at eighty ringgit, okay, uh, which will be very costly because of uh, there's a lot of uh, corruption practice as well as uh, fair competition uh, situation. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, now you look into uh, local uh, procurement. Okay, local pro uh, procurement here is that uh, you also need to actually support local economy because. Um, uh, I earlier I mentioned that if you support local economy, the community basically will be happy with uh, your presence. Sometimes when uh, when you do project, um, normally you actually have disruption. Okay, sometimes you do piling. Okay, there's going to be some noise uh, involved in uh, piling activity. They're going to do some um, knocking. Okay, um, in some of the activity, there's going to be some uh, again some noise, and then you're also going to actually have uh, people coming in and out from project site. We actually going to use some of the road. Which uh, the the place sometimes can be very um, uh, very peaceful and quiet, but now you see a lot of cars passing through the the place. So this is something that you are disturbing the traffic flows, you are disturbing the uh, the community and so on. So there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, disturbance to the community when you are actually doing some project. Okay, so it, this is unavoidable because when you want to look into progress, yeah, is uh, you can't basically escape from not to. Uh, disrupt some of the flow, the local flow or the local or the, uh, 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 the comfort. Okay, but then if you want to actually um, be comfortable, then you stay where you are. You don't move anywhere. Then the minute you you move, you're going to actually cause some uh, discomfort. So when you cause some discomfort, people actually um, will not be happy. Okay, so this is where uh, when you are basically looking into uh, uh, much as you purchase from local. Uh, that people actually say, okay, I'm not only I'm bringing in disruption, but I'm also bringing in economic uh, uh, enhancement at uh, the economic development in the community. So people actually then will have to evaluate, okay, yes, you have some disruption, but again, so you have uh, economic uh, uh, prosperity uh, in that area. So the um, people have to then balance that thing uh, between the two. So what you need to do when you go into a project site, you also need to actually help the local economy. Secondly, also you look into Reduce transportation costs. I did highlight that um, if you buy uh, locally, you don't have to transport item from uh, far away, okay, and you actually uh, lower the greenhouse uh, gas effect, okay. So this is where uh, I say that uh, reduction of uh, what, this um, carbon emission, eh? you can actually reduce in terms of um, carbon emission in a small way, okay. Uh, don't think about uh, having a uh, a solar powered uh, vehicle ataupun solar powered uh, apa, machinery and so on to reduce the uh, um, dependency on uh, electricity and so on but you can actually do it in a small way by uh, buying local okay? and um, also when you look into local procurement and when the uh, local uh, hardware um, shop can actually support you and they look they see you as one of their customer uh, they can actually then um, uh, increase their inventory. So by increasing the inventory, then you can actually have a shorter time delivery. So it will actually help your project. In case you actually need urgently, uh, if you don't have the local um, hardware uh, shop to actually uh, purchase, they will not, not have it in stock. So you got to actually bring it uh, from elsewhere and which is going to cost a couple of days. So that basically will also cost delay in your project. Tapi kalau katakan you are missing uh, some, uh, uh, some items, some special uh, bolt and nut and so on, you can just get it from a local uh, uh, hardware shop, then you actually minimize your uh, your uh, your uh, waiting time. Eh? Because, uh, because kalau katakan benda the, the work is actually being disrupted, then you have people on standby. So that basically will, will lengthen your uh, your project schedule. So these are small small things that is doable. Okay, you can do as a young engineer uh, that you don't need actually uh, look into a higher capacity ataupun uh, higher authority to actually uh, manage some of the activity. Okay, next slide please. Um, on transport, okay, uh, traveling committing, okay, uh, this also, uh, I earlier mentioned that um, you also have uh, opportunity to look into a, then having a Kongsi, okay, um, you can actually then plan for a Kongsi, ataupun you can actually plan for a homestay, uh, sometimes uh, if you have something like uh, 8 to 10 people uh, going to a job site uh, uh, far away, you can actually plan for 
whether for them to actually stay in um, in a hotel atau you provide them with uh, accommodation uh, in a homestay uh, environment okay the whereby uh, you also need to look into how the the logistic with uh, the distance between uh, the job place and so on where you can actually minimize the traveling time and this again you can reduce the, the need of uh, vehicle and uh, by reducing the need of uh, using a car and uh, a motorbike and so on you basically uh, tackle two area one actually on the common emission and the two basically also disturbance to the community sometimes when um, uh, when people actually having cars and so on they can actually park uh, haphazardly and they're going to park uh, within the community area and that basically you upset the community as well jadi these are small things that you can do in order for you to actually manage uh, the traveling or commuting time in order to actually ensure that uh, you have um, overall you have the uh, on the sustainability impact okay next slide please next we look into um, energy okay um, if you have basically um, better logistic you will reduce uh, emission you actually uh, lower the energy cost you also improve the customer service okay in terms of um, uh, your your neighbors will actually will not be upset because um, of all the cars uh, parked uh, being parked uh, all over the uh, their community and also you reduce waste uh, you actually look into how can you minimize uh, in terms of um, fuel uh, usage and so on and uh, in return that you basically uh, making profit for the company okay so these are things all the, all the some of the items uh, when you do uh, you eventually will add value to the company and you will actually add uh, the profit to the company and that makes you actually uh, to be um, um, value adding to the, the company so as young engineer i see one um, important aspect is that uh, you need to actually add value okay um, current uh, cost that probably you've been paid something between um, uh, 3 to 4000 ringgit okay a month okay that uh, what the company expect that you need to actually produce something which is uh, 10 times of what you actually you earn so you need to actually produce something or save the company between 30 to 40000 ringgit either you bring in value uh, of uh, 30 to 40000 ringgit or topon you reduce the company expenses between uh, 30 to 40000 ringgit so this basically uh, how you actually can add value to the uh, to the uh, company okay next slide please on um, on energy okay uh, similarly so you actually look into how can you uh, then, uh, minimize the energy consumption by looking into uh, reduction of energy so this is sometimes uh, you look into optimization bila come to this uh, project uh, sometimes you need to actually use crane sometimes you just need to uh, use fork lift but you need to actually uh, have a uh, lorry to deliver goods and so on so if you can actually uh, look into uh, energy consumption you can actually see how can you um, optimize the machinery you basically reduce uh, the energy cost as well you reduce uh, the carbon emission okay ataupun the carbon footprint and uh, you make yourself basically uh, more eco friendly apa uh, project uh, delivery dan uh, uh, company as well as you improve the overall quality so when you improve the overall quality you also uh, improve the community dan uh, air quality and which uh, the co- uh, community will be more um, tolerant tolerance to your uh, to your project okay next slide please uh, similarly so on this dan uh, uh, um, carbon uh, emission okay uh, this actually you will have to improve uh, in terms of uh, health okay um, because sometimes you if you have to, um, uh, too much of uh, carbon dioxide emission okay when it rains it basically it become acid it's going to have acid rain so when acid rain you also going to affect uh, the um, the project site as well as project uh, the affect the community yeah, in terms of uh, where you operate okay uh, you also look into uh, less resilient to the fossil fuel eh? you use less uh, oil uh, or the uh, hydrocarbon in terms of your project okay next slide please on uh, renewable and clean energy okay um, we look into how uh, some of this um, it may not be within your then uh, within your um, uh, your area i mean as a young engineer but this something that you can actually look into how can you um, lower the demand okay uh, one area basically is to look into um, optimization okay this part i can see that if you want to use a, a crane Okay, when the crane uh, supply to site, you try to actually bundle all the lifting activities in in, in the day where you can actually do uh, multiple activities and uh, activities so that you don't basically uh, get the crane to come in and out uh, from job site because uh, that actually then, uh, 
I will uh, I will create um, um, release of uh, fossil fuel or release of uh, hydrocarbon. Okay, next slide, please. Um, land and water. Look into how can you actually save on the water and uh, uh, air quality. Um, one area in terms of the um, yeah, what you need to do is that uh, is looking the waste. Okay? Uh, when you look into the waste, uh, there's type, normally there's three types of waste. Satu, basically you call it domestic waste, where the food that you, uh, the workers consume, ataupun some of the, um, uh, the item that they actually uh, can, they consume, uh, they use uh, at a site, that basically will be considered as uh, domestic waste. And secondly, actually you look into industrial waste. Now, industrial waste basically some of the, like, for instance, the planks, ataupun apa, uh, the, um, the plastic chips, ataupun some of the um, metals, been used uh, in that uh, construction, okay, in that uh, project, that actually will end up into, uh, to become as an uh, industrial waste. And uh, thirdly, basically, you have um, uh, schedule waste, they call it, okay. Schedule waste, basically, uh, which is hazardous material, which actually uh, can, uh, that it been governed by the, um, by the government, has been scheduled, uh, that actually, that is part of the uh, Department of Environmental, they actually define is what actually is a, a schedule waste, because of the hazardous, there's about um, more than 40 items we've been uh, taken as a schedule waste. And uh, these are the things, for one example, actually like oil. Okay, When you actually um, uh, have sometimes uh, part of a project, you basically have oil, uh, especially when you introduce machinery on site. Uh, it can be a gentle set, a gen set uh, on site, at the phone, uh, welding machine on site. You basically also uh, have a situation sometimes the uh, the oil tank, at the when you want to transfer the oil uh, from uh, diesel, from uh, from plastic bottle into the uh, gen set at the point into the uh, welding machine, you actually have spillage of that uh, of this uh, material. Okay, these are basically the uh, uh, shale waste, and that spillage ends up in the, uh, the uh, underground. It leads into the uh, groundwater. Okay, when it goes into the groundwater, you're going to actually contaminate the groundwater, and this groundwater eventually it goes into the nearby river, at the it goes to the sea. So basically, you're contaminating the, the river at the point, contaminating the, the sea. So this is something which, um, when you basically uh, have this situation, whereby they cut your project site, you need to actually ensure that uh, you you prevent this spillage into the ground level, uh, the ground, okay? Uh, which is, uh, you can uh, you can manage it, you you can do, as an engineer. Another area, basically, look into the uh, release of air. Uh, when you are talking about, um, Sometimes they do open burning, okay. Sometimes they also do uh, uh, some of the plank uh, materials more instead of disposing it, they, they actually burn it at uh, the site. Uh, this uh, actually, this practice actually is illegal. You're not able to actually uh, do open burning on a job site. Uh, you need to actually then capture that as uh, industrial waste and you got to dispose it, okay. Uh, this um, that you need to actually ensure that um, on the job site, you actually have to collect all this, uh, all this waste and then you need to actually dispose it accordingly. And some of this waste can also be a fire hazard. Tapi kalau macam, I'm sure that you also learn about this uh, fire triangle. Eh? You basically have the uh, oxygen um, ignition uh, or the spark as well as a uh, flammable material. Uh, jadi kalau dekat project site, uh, when you want to actually ensure that uh, you actually uh, apa, uh, eliminate fire, you need to eliminate or remove one of item. Okay, oxygen you cannot actually uh, remove because it's in uh, part of the air. Okay. Um, uh, you're actually not able to actually uh, take out oxygen away. And then uh, this uh, spark at the point initial, uh, you cannot actually sometimes uh, remove because of uh, you need to do some welding activities at the point you need to do some knocking activities which can create spark at the point item. The, the other area that you can actually rem uh, remove is looking into the flavor material. Flavor material, sometimes you have actually cloth at the point plastic material, at the point plank material, wooden material and so on in the project site where you can actually uh, segregate, isolate it and to ensure that it's not part of your uh, apa, dekat dengan your itu your project work atau project activity, you got to then uh, do your housekeeping to ensure that it been properly segregated. So this is uh, again that um, you need to actually then uh, realize that uh, some of the materials uh, in the project site, uh, macam pyrophoric, okay, is a uh, safinite. Jadi kalau you have your project uh, melibatkan uh, some pyrophoric material. Uh, if you leave it into open space, it will actually ignite by itself. So you got to leave it underwater. So when the need that uh, project, you in here you need to understand that uh, okay, if you work in oil and gas, you actually will, you will experience a lot of the material are basically also a uh, fluorophoric base that it can actually self ignite. Uh, that you get some of the um, hydrocarbon can also be self ignite because of the uh, 
auto ignition uh, itu is very low. Uh, jadi you just go into open air, you can have ignite. Jadi uh, you as a young engineer, you need to actually also uh, understand that uh, the, the impact that you can actually create that it can actually cause a fire, a fire hazard in the in the job site. Okay. So when a uh, situation a fire hazard, then you also have a stop work order. When stop because of investigation. So when a stop work order, you're going to actually have delay the project. Delay the project, you're going to actually have escalation in your cost. Uh, then when you want to actually uh, apa, resume your project, you got to actually then apa, speed up your cost. When you speed up your cost, you got to actually have impact on your uh, safety and quality. So benda ni semua ber berkait. Ber eh? All that actually have uh, is interrelated. So the minute you actually have uh, some of the safety outcome in the uh, job site, you can impact your economy. And economy, you can impact your schedule and you can schedule can impact your quality when you want to try to actually uh, then, uh, expedite uh, the, the project and so on. Okay. Next slide, please. So, in terms of uh, water consumption, um, you should look into how can you actually reduce uh, water cost, how can you actually uh, minimize uh, water then consumption, how can you actually recycle water, and how can you actually decrease the risk of contamination, especially on the uh, surface runoff water. Sometimes you're going to have situation whereby uh, with heavy rain, you're going to have actually a surface runoff. So, how can actually this surface runoff water uh, not been channeled into um, into the open drain. Sometimes these are uh, also uh, have some oil element and some of it have some uh, some uh, metal, small metal in it. It can go to drain, and once it go into drain, it can go into the um, into the river, uh, and from the river it goes to the sea. So you are basically uh, extending the contamination uh, from the job, job site until the, the until the sea. Okay, and um, other area actually is to increase the public engagement. How can you actually then um, uh, make the uh, public, especially your neighbors, aware that uh, what you are doing basically is to minimize uh, contamination as well as uh, to minimize water. Um, there are many places, uh, for instance, overseas. Okay, uh, Malaysia is uh, less being uh, used, but there are also some project site also they look into water and uh, rain harvesting. Okay, in Malaysia we have a lot, a lot of rain, and then the, this rain harvesting can actually used for. Uh, cleaning water, cleaning uh, then, uh, not to use for as potable water for drinking ataupun for uh, to refresh yourself, but we can actually use for uh, for cleaning ataupun for watering uh, of the uh, of the site and so on. Okay, you can actually use uh, rain water and you can uh, then, uh, minimize the um, the use of uh, fresh water and resulting from you minimize the the cost of the project. Okay. Next slide, please. And um, I mentioned earlier on the recycling and uh, reuse, I think it's very important for you to actually uh, consider uh, how to actually um, recycle and uh, reuse some material. Kalau you look into uh, most of the current, eh, I think the, I give you an example is that uh, if you look into the um, the road barrier, okay, um, or the, the road divider, uh, currently sometimes they use um, concrete uh, road divider uh, to separate between the two between the two lanes, the oncoming and outgoing uh, vehicle. And uh, that uh, road divider, basically, um, when they do concrete, they got to use, um, uh, when they want to construct it, they use for work. Okay, in the past, a lot of it, they use uh, plank, they use uh, plywood to use, uh, to build up the, uh, the for work. But now you go to, they use metal. Okay, basically, they use, uh, they construct the metal to, uh, in order for you to, run as a from, from work. And once they complete it, they just uh, open up and they actually go to work. So they can actually use, um, uh, ten of hundreds of uh, kilometer of this uh, road divider using uh, recycle uh, metal uh, from work. Okay, so but not lah that uh, you can basically uh, uh, consider how can you actually uh, reuse recycle. Um, now you look into if uh, they don't basically dispose the um, the bitumen that they, when they scrape uh, the bitumen uh, when they actually do uh, remetal the uh, the road. Okay, they scrape it out and then they actually recycle the, the the bitumen and they use back. Uh, into the road. Yeah. So this is something that uh, they don't uh, dispose. Uh, long time ago, uh, they used to actually dispose it uh, at the um, industrial site, uh, all this uh, waste um, bitumen uh, from scraping of the of the road. Okay. Next. Uh. <coughs> Next slide, please. So by um, having a uh, reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable co uh, consumption, okay, you actually avoid uh, contamination as well as avoid uh, pollution. So basically, um, in long term or long run, you actually help in terms of uh, 
environmental impact okay to make sure that you don't have any leaching of um, uh, water into the ground okay you do not actually have uh, any um, release of um, toxic gas into the uh, into the environment you also will not actually have any uh, noise pollution and so on so this is where uh, by having uh, an effective uh, planning effective uh, activities that you uh, you do at the job site you can actually uh, eliminate at least at least minimize uh, some of the contamination and pollution in order to actually uh, make uh, the um, your job site uh, being uh, more sustainable okay next slide please in terms of uh, waste generation um, if you basically uh, able to recycle uh, reuse or repurpose uh, most of the material then you basically have uh, minimal waste material uh, okay, because when you actually have minimal waste material you have actually minimal uh, disposal okay sometimes on the job site they can actually spend um, lorries and lorries basically just to to send from job site going to the um, municipal dumping ground okay municipal dumping ground can actually be either you go to the um, uh, domestic waste uh, or top industrial waste and it can actually sometimes um, my experience is that uh, to to bring one uh, lorry load of uh, waste, okay, industrial waste, from one side to another to the uh, to the side, it can cost uh, two three hundred ringgit. You just imagine if you're going to send something like um, hundred lorries, it's going to cost a lot uh, for the company. So this is where if you can basically uh, minimize the waste, you can basically recycle um, uh, the the spent material. You basically also will reduce the cost uh, for the company, and eventually uh, you improve on the project uh, profit. And that basically guarantees that uh, you still have a job. Okay. Uh, jadi sometimes um, as young engineers, kita tak boleh kata that okay, it's okay lah. Yeah, not not my money, my company money. He going to spend all this on this project, kan? It's okay. I can actually be a bit wasteful, and uh, uh, because it's uh, the company is paying for it. Uh, but um, if you look into the the overall uh, picture, basically by not helping the company to save money, by not helping the company to make profit eventually will actually impact on your co uh, on your job because of the company will not afford to actually pay your salary the company will not afford to actually en engage you uh, long term because of the company is not making money jadi um, in a way that you need to really help the company to make money okay it's not a sin eh? not to say that uh, you're basically pro make profit is a sin some people say that well, making profit is a sin and then uh, making profit basically not good and so on tapi you need to actually then, to be sustainable the company have to make money and then to actually be sustainable in your job, you need to actually have the company make money. So these are things. Eh? At the end of the day, uh, being a young engineer, uh, you have a duty to ensure that your company stay afloat, your company is actually remain uh, positive, so that they can actually uh, to continue to, to engage you uh, as, a, uh, as a young engineer. Okay, next slide please. So now we look into the, uh, the, the prosperity impact or the economic impacts. Okay? Uh, kalau kita look into uh, some of these uh, business case analysis, okay, um, okay, some of it uh, basically, uh, I think you must also learn about um, project economics. I think in your in your study, okay, uh, you also learn a bit of uh, some of these items uh, in terms of um, business case, okay, how you actually look into um, into the ROI, uh, uh, return on investment. And then it can not necessarily that you have actually a mega project. You look into your return on investment. You can also look into when you actually apa, uh, sub the project or when you buy material or when you actually look into uh, certain items, uh, sometimes apa, machinery, you want to actually, you see that whether are you actually um, bringing the ROI to the uh, to the company in terms of engaging some of these activities. Okay, are you basically uh, looking into um, minimizing the waste, okay, in terms of uh, when you optimize, okay, um, a project of six months, you may do a lifting, uh, a lot of lifting, and this lifting, when you combine it, can be two months. So you can actually have a situation in which you actually engage um, a crane for six months throughout the project period, after you only engage the crane for two months. Only when, when you optimize it to do all the required lifting during the, uh, during the six months, uh, within the two months, sorry, out of the six month project. Jadi, this is a thing which, as an engineer, you can basically plan the, the activity. You can actually look how can I actually minimize the, uh, um, the, uh, the the use of machinery for a particular project, and how can you actually then uh, add value to the uh, uh, to the um, to the return of the of the company? Okay, so these are basically uh, some of it. 
uh, you can actually make some decision if within your area of decision making okay especially when you are actually been tasked uh, to manage a small project uh, probably a three months six months uh, project uh, where you can basically uh, ensure that how to uh, optimize the manpower how to optimize the the machinery as well how to optimize the material and so on so they basically we're looking into uh, resource management as i, I mentioned tadi you see how to reduce uh, that uh, waste stage in the turf of resources so this is part of your that as a young engineer you can basically help to uh, to reduce on the wastage of resources okay, okay. Uh, next slide please so uh, on return investment okay uh, some of the item that uh, you can make addition in terms of uh, what you need to actually uh, do in order for you to actually be able to uh, turn, um, uh, to decide and benefit for the company okay you can actually uh, this is where some uh, decision making need to be done okay um, we as engineer we have the power of analysis i think that basically kalau kita comparekan dengan apa uh, non engineer okay non engineer they don't apa uh, they don't actually been exposed to a lot of uh, critical thinking they don't be exposed to a lot of uh, analysis jadi their power analysis and power of uh, critical thinking are basically will be slightly uh, i would say lower than engineers eh? so we have actually so we need to actually capitalize it. Uh, we need to actually ensure that uh, as an engineer our power analysis our, our um, um, uh, critical thinking basically is uh, uh, is, is high so we need to make sure that um, we use it uh, to the uh, to the fullest in terms of decision making okay how to actually uh, analyze things how to actually then um, make decision based on um, based on our uh, um, based on our analysis okay so uh, sometimes as young engineers uh, we tend to actually look into the, the decision we made because of it been done in the past uh, jadi this is quite common uh, jadi you don't have to think you don't have to use your brain power you just say that what it been done in the past you, you are doing it again today uh, jadi you just continue so you just like monkey see monkey do and what been done in the past you just continue okay this is where uh, as a young engineer you got to challenge you got to ask why why are we doing this way is there, is there a better way uh, we can do it and then you keep, keep on uh, you keep on thinking okay challenge your uh, challenge your mind okay do and then you can basically uh, look into uh, improving on into the activities that what you're doing okay by improving the activity you also uh, to improve on the productivity you also can improve on the efficiency you can also improve on the cost saving and so on jadi uh, i would like to actually um like to see that uh, as a young engineer you always uh, challenge uh, the the norm okay uh, jadi because um, sometimes they they always say that uh, things have been done on a regular basis okay it become a norm okay by when you you question why was it been done uh, this way nobody can answer you just to say that because uh, my senior did it okay when i when i came to the company this is how they do it so when I ask the person uh, why they do it, they, uh, they said, okay, yeah, when I joined uh, in 1980, yeah, this is how it's been done. So my senior in 1970. So when 1970, I asked the person, yeah, this is basically what's been done. So basically, it just been carried forward from 1960s, 1970s, 80s, right until uh, your present day, that how uh, it's been done. And then this thing which you can basically question, uh, why it's been done this way? Is there a better way to do it? Okay, uh, then you, this is where you use your power analysis as engineer kita basically we are strong in our uh, analytical thinking okay you use it okay uh, next slide please next you look into the uh, business agility okay um, how you can actually help the, uh, the company in terms of being flexible in terms of um, uh, resources sometimes you actually look into uh, how can you manage um, lower resources or how can actually manage uh, resources which are less uh, skillful okay you need to also look into how can you actually respond to some of the uh, activities sometimes uh, you have a situation whereby uh, you have in the project site some is uh, inevitable sometimes you have actually a uh, change order ataupun variation order maknanya uh, you have a fixed scope and then uh, you've been asked to do additional scope so as an engineer, you need to see then to say that, okay, with this additional scope, how can I actually respond? How can I use my same manpower? After how can I actually bring in additional resources to actually manage this uh, additional co-work? Uh, probably within the same time frame, ataupun uh, you look into it within the same budget and so on. So this is the thing which um, uh, you need to actually uh, support in terms of uh, business activity. How effective, how um, competitive your company will be, ataupun the company that you work with, 
is also depend on how agile is the, the company. And how agile is the company is that is also is how you actually think, how you react. As a young engineer, you can basically support in terms of providing um, some of your uh, initiative or some of your thinking ability in order to actually uh, cater for uh, unexpected event. Okay, next slide please. Okay, in terms of economic simulation, uh, again, I, I think I, I mentioned about uh, buy local. Okay, if you look into um, buying a local product, you're also helping the local economy. And then when you have the local economy, you can also help your, pro your project because of you have local support. Okay, uh, this again, that um, if you are basically able to uh, develop the local talent, okay, uh, then in case of any um, requirement for you to increase your... Um, your pool of uh, people, okay, you can actually bring it from local. Tapi kalau katakan you don't develop uh, local, you only bring it all from um, from home. For instance, like if you are doing job in uh, Alusta, you bring everybody from Kuala Lumpur. And then in the case of you need additional manpower uh, to complete your job on time or additional manpower to actually uh, do additional job and so on, you are not able to actually use local talent because you don't develop. And then you can bawa it to KL. So this basically uh, cost money, cost time and also uh, will impact on your uh, on the schedule and so on. So this is again, uh, is very important for you when you wherever you go, you also need to actually um, look into how can you develop uh, local talent and this local talent can also be your uh, your future uh, workers uh, when you have a similar project in a, in a, at the site. Okay. Next slide please. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that um, as engineer, okay, when we practice um, uh, in the project, we can actually look into how can we uh, manage uh, uh, our resources efficiently. Okay, our resources here basically how can we manage our manpower, how can we manage the material, and how can we manage uh, the machinery uh, effectively in order for us to actually uh, ensure that we protect the environment. Okay, um, uh, as I uh, uh, we know that there's not that uh, if we optimize the things and we basically able to uh, work on the um, uh, on the effective uh, manpower, we basically will minimize uh, in terms of um, logistic transportation and adding in uh, more manpower to, to the job site. Okay, and uh, the other area actually we look into. Um, we are also responsible to design and implement solution. Okay, jadi as an engineer ataupun as young engineer, kita basically uh, uh, in a way, in a small way, atau in a big way, you basically also look into how you can design the the project flow. How can you design the project activity as well? How can you implement uh, the solution? And uh, with that, you can also look into how can you reduce the environmental impact. I just meant, I highlighted earlier. How can you look into the uh, uh, the public safety as well? How can you actually uh, support the economic growth? Jadi, all these items I mentioned uh, in the beginning of my slide, okay? Uh, you may be thinking that it basically is something like this big thing that uh, uh, that you need to do or to something that uh, not achievable as a young engineer. Tapi as I go through the slide, I give some example uh, that you is manageable. You can actually do. It's doable. And you can basically uh, have some impact uh, as a young engineer uh, to the uh, to any project uh, site. Okay? So by um, following these sustainable engineering practices, we can make uh, better, um, the world a better place. Okay? With that, uh, thank you very much. Next slide. Okay, thank you. And uh, I can open to um, any question. So now it's 10.30, I think basically the next session is 11. So probably you have about half an hour if you have any question that you'd like to, to ask. Okay, terima kasih. Thank you, uh, Tuan uh, Engineer Hisham Nihaya. Uh, is there any question from the student? You can freely uh, turn on your mic and uh, ask the question. Um, you can ask me a question in English ataupun dalam bahasa Melayu, okay, whichever apa, comfortable to you. Tapi yang penting sekali is that um, try to make this session interactive. You can ask me uh, whatever question especially pertaining to industry. Uh, jadi, uh, I basically, I conduct uh, classes, eh, I mentioned kat masa. Jadi, when the class buat presentation, I also say that the student tanya soalan dapat point. Because I want to encourage, I want to actually develop this culture of asking question. Jadi the student yang ask question, they get point add up to their to their overall total score. 
Jadi that's why when uh, apa, when the uh, student make presentation in my class, a lot a lot of question been asked because they get coin points for that. Tapi yang ni tak ada point lah. You too, I will not able to give you any point for asking question. Yeah, student need to to prepare question so that you can do the report kan. Uh, so mungkin Ami Hazik boleh tanya dulu. Uh, Assalamualaikum sir. Assalamualaikum. Uh, my name is from M A. I want to call D A. Your voice breaking. Tadi ngah. Uh, so is it apa tanya tu maybe you can type in the 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 question to to the chat okay that one yeah there's one question being does sustainability are important in any type of job scope and not only for engineers Okay, uh, basically when talking about sustainability practice, uh, basically applies to you know, to everybody, uh, whether you're basically a manufacturer or basically you are um, a constructor or even you are a designer. Jadi, when you're a designer, not only com uh, comply to, I mean, uh, confined to engineers, designer can also be um, architect or uh, uh, other, um, uh, other trade or uh, discipline. Uh, jadi basically it applies to everyone. Okay, uh, but very important actually is that because of uh, engineers kita terlibat secara langsung in term of uh, construction activities. Jadi because of that, we are basically be seen as one of the um, the destroyer of the environment. Uh, kalau kita buat construction, because kalau architect basically they mainly be involved in design, but then we as engineer we basically involved in construction. When we are in construction, that's basically the biggest impact. Uh, in this construction activity, maknanya kita basically will have a release of uh, of air, uh, gases into the environment. We also have a leaching of um, uh, contaminant into the groundwater, and then we also have uh, uh, noise pollution and so on. So these are things where we do. Tapi uh, they also uh, um, for non engineers they also yes get involved. Okay, the other question from uh, Adli is: uh, Is there any sustainability practice mistake for that commonly made? by R&D manufacturing uh, engineers. Okay, in R&D, basically, ataupun when you are involved in a design, we look into um, how your design can actually uh, uh, create less impact uh, to the environment. For instance, when your design basically will eventually be operated, your design basically will be uh, used ataupun consumed by the by the masses, by the people. So then you look into how can actually you minimize your design uh, uh, to then, to minimize the uh, impact on the major for instance, if you want to design uh, disposed uh, a waste uh, major plastic can uh, plastic can plastic uh, bottles and so on so you can actually see that can your design basically be reused or repurposed by uh, by the people in uh, for different purposes kalau they can actually reuse it then they will not actually dispose your plastic bottle they actually want to reuse it jadi you minimize the waste uh, these these are things which uh, if you are involved in uh, R&D, uh, in manufacturing, you also can uh, uh, contribute towards uh, that sustainability. Okay, next question is, how does nature use resources to improve air quality? Okay, um, in terms of um, uh, minimizing the, uh, the air quality, uh, kalau kita look into um, most of the factory, they actually have, uh, so they install this, uh, um, Precipitator, okay. Precipitator actually, kalau dekat chimney, you look at uh, some of the, uh, kalau you you are close to uh, power station, uh, power plant. Power plant currently, when they burn uh, coal, they use a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of sulfur release, a lot of uh, ash release. Uh, they basically have a filter to capture. Huh? Maknanya, whatever release uh, to the air is uh, a lot of it been, uh, been filtered, been cleaned, so you don't have basically a lot of... Um, ashes, you don't have a lot of uh, toxic material be released. So this is where um, what Malaysia is doing as also is part of the requirement uh, in the law to say that whatever that you release has to be uh, that uh, have to meet certain uh, requirement. Okay. Is there any uh, next question is uh, by Nur Alia. Uh, 
is there any possible approach for sustainability that Malaysia has not yet taken? Okay, Malaysia basically have done a lot of initiative in terms of sustainability. Okay, this is basically based on the, the current engineers uh, that we have now. Uh, the future engineers, you may actually have a lot of more uh, you know, sustainable activities that you can uh, look at. Okay, this is where um, uh, that when you go into the um, into the job market, uh, that you can actually apply uh, some responsibility. For instance, like I say, that it can be as simple as um, housekeeping uh, to ensure that your workplace basically has been uh, housekeeped, to ensure that you don't release um, contaminant into the groundwater, you don't basically release uh, toxic uh, gases into the into the environment and then you don't release uh, uh, noise uh, into the environment ataupun you don't create any harmful uh, situation macam the mosquito ataupun snake ataupun uh, itu uh, into the into the neighbor and, uh, neighborhood and so on. So benda-benda macam ni which as a young engineer uh, is doable. Okay, as you get um, more experience in your work, you can basically look into a higher level of um, engineering practices. Okay. By Muhammad Alman, uh, sorry sir, I wanted to ask you about to recognize, you don't, you don't have to be sorry, you just can ask the question. I wanted to ask about how to recognize if the company is sustainable in the future, especially in Malaysia. Um, most of the company you can actually uh, check in the website. Now a lot of company basically, they have their company profile, ataupun uh, they have their company activities in the, in the, um, uh, in the website. Eh? You can actually go through the website. Kalau katakan the company is berhad, okay, the company basically probably is third. You can uh, read through the, um, uh, the annual report. Okay, now part of the requirement uh, by Malaysia is that uh, they need to actually do ESG reporting. ESG basically um, environmental, social and governance report. So they need to actually say that what they do, they do to ensure that they got to actually protect the environment, they got to protect the, the, uh, the people. The, the people basically they, their own workers ataupun the neighbours to ensure that uh, they comply to this um, uh, to these activities okay you can see uh, run through in the website i can you can also um, uh, check through some of the practices okay um, from the uh, from the uh, website or from, from uh, your google you can see you can check so this way uh, you can basically get um, uh, overview of the company whether they practice uh, as a sustainable development or not and then secondly is that sometimes uh, you can also uh, check with uh, your network uh, someone who works there or someone who actually um, deal with a company, you can see whether this company basically practice as well. So this is something that uh, you can do. Uh, and um, I hope most of you are actually a member of IEM, Institution, uh, Institution of Engineers Malaysia. Okay, uh, you can basically uh, uh, network with some of the engineers in IEM, young engineers, and they can basically can also assist in terms of tell this company, yes, they practice sustainability uh, ataupun tidak. Okay. Next question is from Afik uh, Sharmin. Do you agree that as engineer, the most environment conscious action that can be taken is to holistically design with sustainability in mind? For example, design with sustainable material with aftermarket. Um, okay. okay. Basically, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's true because uh, in terms of uh, sustainable practice, you actually start uh, in the beginning. It basically, uh, as earlier I say that you can actually ideally you start in the design uh, phase. Tapi kalau you are actually in the construction phase, you got to you can also have in terms of some of the activities. But in terms of uh, what being brought, uh, what material being brought, or what machinery being brought on site, uh, you sometimes have no control because it's been designed. Okay, sometimes uh, kalau katakan the, the material is apa is um, uh, less efficient material. Okay. Um, uh, pumps ataupun motors atau whatever been uh, be designed and be brought to site, you basically have uh, no control in terms of uh, making it more efficient because uh, by nature that material. Uh, jadi uh, in terms of uh, design phase, this is where uh, you look into how can actually you you design uh, equipment to be uh, uh, highly efficient in order to actually ensure that you be more sustainable in terms of your overall uh, budget uh, uh, project delivery. Next question by Afik Shamil and Kelly is that after market care instruction increase repairability, etc. I can't, I don't quite get the question. Uh, but, yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, okay. Okay, so after market care instruction increase repairability, yes. So, uh, normally part of the um, design, actually, if you work in a design uh, company, 
Okay, uh, part of the design basically uh, three areas uh, that you need to focus on. Uh, one basically is uh, you know, uh, constructivity. Okay, the, the material about the project you do is can be constructed. Okay, you can you need to actually ensure that uh, whatever uh, design that someone can actually be either can construct it. But two, operability okay, can be operated uh, effectively. And third, maintainability uh, can be maintained. Uh, these are the things that you need to actually focus on um, when you actually do design. Uh, kalau tidak, I always tell uh, young engineers, uh, you can maki je lah dengan, uh, dengan uh, apa, op, uh, operation team ataupun on maintenance, dia kata apa ni, engineer design ni, engineer bodoh ni, design benda yang apa, I cannot maintain because when you want to take out the material, the the motor for instance, you got to actually cut, chop down the uh, the piping because of piping is actually in the way. So you you have to uh, itu, uh, cut the piping in order for you to remove because it's just not accessible. It's accessible. Because selalunya when you do a project, you pasang the motor and the pump dulu, lepas you pasang the piping. Tapi when you remove the pump and motor, you, you, the piping is still there. So you then you need to take out the piping atau chop off the piping. Jadi this is where it's not uh, maintainability. You cannot maintain uh, effectively. So when you design, you need to look into the tree. Yeah? You can able to construct, you able to effectively, you able to operate effectively, you able to maintain. There are basically cases which I find that especially in the oil and, even in the oil and gas environment, that the um, the pressure meter okay been right up to the sky jadi kalau nak tengok kena pakai binoculars jadi it's not basically it's very difficult to, uh, to operate eh? you can chapel you to be eye level eh? you are touch uh, chest level be able you to read some uh, uh, valve that you need to operate you need to actually apa use a ladder ataupun you need to use access apa platform to to close the shut off the valve and so on which is still then also is again um is not uh, accessible and then it's not uh, practical also and uh, it's not um, operability is not atau maintainability is not is not good eh? jadi um, again kalau you are involved in design you always have to bear in mind that uh, three things you need to look at uh, one is constructivity to be able to construct well two is um, operability you need to be able to allow the operation to operate effectively and third is maintainability you need to actually allow uh, people who want to maintain equipment to be able to maintain it uh, uh, effectively as well Uh, next question by Ame Hazik. How can engineers balance the short-term goals of their project with long-term sustainability objective, especially when immediate result is more important? Okay. There are basically cases whereby um, you actually look into a long-term sustainability practices, okay, uh, where sometimes it's uh, uh, very distant in the future and it's going to cost you a lot of money, okay. Uh, but what uh, you can do uh, is that try to actually make small bits, make small uh, incremental uh, changes where you can actually uh, uh, do today and to ensure that you actually achieve uh, what's important in, that, uh, in the future, okay? Let me give an example. Okay, if you look into a long-term approach on competent person ataupun your high productivity uh, in, the, in, the, in the workplace. So high productivity, basically, you need to have a competent person. Uh, having competent person, basically, you need to have... Uh, Uh, people that you need to develop people from then uh, probably sometimes from scratch eh? you, you you engage uh, people for people for a project then you need to actually train them and then you need to actually i mentioned you need to actually ensure that these people are happy uh, work environment is good so that these people four people stay so the next project you actually continue with these four people okay then they actually improve in terms of their uh, in terms of their skill and then over the years eh, uh, when they're talking about 10 years uh, down the road you have these four people in your Uh, organization, these people basically uh, be very skillful and because of skillful, they are very productive. And because they are productive, then they can actually able to do the work with the less uh, less wastage ataupun in the less uh, um, uh, time uh, you know, time as well as uh, improve the the profit for the company. So these are the way by you look into long-term sustainability uh, practices that you are targeting in terms of uh, having high productivity, having high efficiency, having high uh, margin for the company. But you can actually do uh, from the start uh, today that to ensure that the people actually work for you, remain, and then uh, whatever that they learn from where they become more competent, they actually minimize wastage because the error that they make will be less. Uh, katakan kalau they got to actually cut from apa, a piece of plate, eh, 4x8 uh, plate, if they are not competent, probably they're going to be a lot of wastage. 30% will be just go to waste. Tapi kalau dia competent, eventually only about 5%, 10% only go to waste. So this setting which they minimize the the wastage and eventually minimize the cost. Okay, okay next question uh, by Muhammad Nazrin. If contaminant were mistakenly released to the environment, what step do we take? Okay, um, 
depending on the contaminant. Okay, kalau katakan release to the uh, to the air, okay, um, very little you can do because you're going to what you will release the air. What you can do basically, uh, you can actually um, if a toxic material be released, sometimes what the company will do actually the company got to uh, generate the uh, emergency response, uh, tier one uh, response. In which case they got to actually send people to um, to neighbors and uh, advise the neighbor to say they have to stay indoor. Do outside activity because you actually release a toxic gas. Okay, um, that's where uh, you're you're more on the reactive action. Okay, you need to actually then say tell people to leave outdoor, or you tell people that you got to leave town because of uh, that's incident of gas release. Just like uh, if you read through the Bhopal incident where they release toxic gas and they actually tell uh, people have to leave town, and then but that also a lot of people died because of uh, the inhale. Uh, the, uh, they're also closer to home. There also incident in uh, Pasir Gudang where uh, they actually release uh, some uh, material, to them, um, some toxic material, where it causes uh, people to actually vomit and then people get sick and so on. So they also advise people to actually leave town or stay uh, stay indoor in order to uh, to, um, to prevent this contaminant from escalating. And uh, the next item, basically, if the contaminant is actually go into the groundwater. Okay, then you need to actually one area that you can uh, look at it. You got to do where is the the ending source. Katakan the groundwater it will end up into a monsoon drain. Monsoon drain goes to the nearby river, and the nearby river goes to the sea. Then you got to actually address ar to arrest. You basically need to to stop the um, the either monsoon drain. You got to rechannel. You got to treat it before you actually you release back to the that, um, back to the river. Ataupun you got to actually ensure how can you um, neutralize the, the the toxic uh, material, the, the chemical. Uh, uh, so these are things which um, uh, normally for a company which actually uh, having this sort of um, hazardous contaminant, they also need to actually have uh, part of it is uh, the what they call ERP, emergency response plan. Emergency response plan is basically how they handle crisis. Kalau the situation where going to be a crisis, macam mana they going to respond? Okay, they got to actually. Work. Okay, I was actually with Shell uh, many years ago. Uh, actually involved in uh, managing this uh, crisis. Okay, we do a situation whereby we do simulation. Uh, kalau they're going to be our neighbor, because we also run uh, some pipeline underground, uh, bakar. So we got to mobilize the bomber, we got to mobilize the police uh, to go around to neighbors, we give uh, advice for them to stay indoor. We got to actually uh, bring in, uh, call in the, from Negri, uh, Negri uh, I got to report eh? we have to call from uh, Negri to support. And so these are basically, we have a tier 1, tier 2, tier, tier 3 punya situation. Tier 1 basically, local tier 2 is uh, the state level and tier 3 basically is the, the, the countrywide uh, support that we need to actually run to ensure that what happened in emergency, we got to have a, a, a solution. Okay. 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 Next item we have from uh, Amir Hazik. Do you believe that regulation are necessary to compare sustainable practice, or do you have confidence in the ability of industries to voluntarily prioritize sustainability over time? Um, basically, it's a mix. Okay. If you are talking about uh, some of the uh, companies which um, we do don't basically uh, look into. Um, I would say that uh, local companies basically they don't look into um, international practices. Okay, you need regulation to ensure that uh, they actually comply to regulation. They comply to all these uh, sustainable practices. Okay? But for the case of international company, okay, where where I, I come from, Shell before, okay, uh, we don't really uh, look into uh, government regulation, but we look into uh, international sustainable practice. We look into what we are going to apply in production has to be similarly been applied in like Australia, similarly um, been applied in um, Stanlo in UK, similarly uh, similarly going to be applied in uh, other parts of the world. Okay, Because we need to actually ensure that it's a standard application all over the world. So, maknanya, we cannot say that uh, you practice differently in uh, in UK and practice differently in uh, Finland and you practice differently in, in KL ataupun in uh, Philippines. Eh? So, we need to actually uh, manage the whole thing in a sustainable measure all, all over the world. Jadi, uh, to international companies, multinational, uh, yes, we don't need um, um, high requirement or regulation, uh, but for the local company, uh, we do need, uh, I believe, uh, because of sometimes we uh, can, local company, uh, they are basically um, more focused on profit uh, rather than uh, being sustainable. Uh, jadi, this is where, um, as you, as a young engineer, if you go into this company, 
uh, you you need to look into how can you make uh, some small changes. Eventually, you allow these companies also to to comply to uh, international uh, requirements. Okay. Any other question? I think I'm done with uh, all the written question being put forward. Time is at ten fifty. Okay, I think you have a next session is at eleven o'clock. Uh, jadi, uh, kalau there's no more question uh, from you, uh, I'd like to actually thank you very much uh, for listening. Okay, I really appreciate uh, your time uh, and uh, I wish you all the best uh, in your work life. Um, basically, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, if you are four flat in the university, it means nothing if you're not four flat in the industry. Jadi, uh, your, uh, apa? your delivery basically when you are outside in the industry, uh, always remember when you are in the industry, you spend money. And when you're outside, you make money. So basically, it's important for you to be four flat in making money rather than four flat in uh, spending money. Jadi, I wish you all the best. Can I study hard? Make sure that you get good result in order for you to actually uh, be considered uh, in a better uh, environment. Kalau you want to work in uh, online gas industry, minimum three, uh, three point, uh, three pointer. Okay, and then uh, and the other area that you need to actually uh, be able to um, to speak, I mean, uh, communication is very important. Because um, when they engage uh, people, especially in the oil and gas uh, industry, they don't only uh, look into whether you are 3.8 or 3.2. Uh, they may come from, they consider the 3.2 because of uh, you can communicate well. You are able to actually, because as an engineer, we can communicate a lot. You can to actually communicate to your boss, you can to communicate to your colleague, you can to communicate to your uh, subordinate, to the workplace and so on. That the communication skill is very important. And you also need to learn about uh, each group uh, because you're not only good to, uh, to speak out, uh, to, uh, to communicate dengan people your each group. I allow so there is no such thing on that one. Jadi sometimes you go to speak to people yang apa, uh, 45 years old, 50 years old, eh? uh, kalau tu dia pun Pak Haji, Pak Lebay ke whatever, so, because these people are still working, okay, they are going to be a technician uh, in your organization and you need to actually address them well and you need to actually, you know, apa, able to tackle them in order to motivate them and uh, and I mentioned earlier, if you motivate them, they are going to actually be more priority and going to create a positive environment. So with that, Thank you very much. Wish you all the best. And over back to uh, Ken. Okay, terima kasih. Alhamdulillah. Terima kasih kepada Engineer Ihsan Yahya atas perkongsian tadi. Uh, terima kasih banyak. So, uh, dengan itu, kita akhirkan kita punya sesi untuk pagi ini. Kita akan tutup semula pada sesi seterusnya pada pukul uh, 11. Terima kasih. Thank you. Okay. Okay, bye. So, thank you. Salam, salam. Um. Jangan remain dalam platform ni lagi ya. Eh? Ah, boleh rehat dulu. Ke sebelah nanti kita next session.
شريف Assalamualaikum Tuan Khairul Nizam Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Dengar Dengar eh? Boleh clear eh? Alhamdulillah dengar dengar Sekejap eh Saya tengah nak share screen ni Tak biasa dengan Webex ni Lalu Microsoft Teams eh Oh iyalah Boleh aku cuba set up dulu Chat apa Dia punya slide tu Okay Nampak saya punya slide eh? Haa ah, dah keluar dah oh. Clear eh? Hmm ini bukan presentation board lah tapi keluar tu. Sekejap saya tengah tukar swap. Dia boleh keluar. Dah nampak? Dia masih lagi yang bukan. Bukan ni. Ya. Sekarang sama juga? Sama juga lah. Ha ni presentation board lah. Ni cek cek. Saya window eh. Yeah. Ya, yeah, saya tak download dia punya Webex ni, saya pakai browser je. Oh, boleh, boleh kok kalau eh boleh ke doktor? Macam mana? Ya. Yeah. Still ni eh. Ah uh, bukan presentation mode. Bukan presentation mode nanti. Mana kita? Kalau kita dekat mana? <laughs> Dekat slide itu boleh setting ke? Sekejap. Dekat slide itu dia. Dekat slide itu set, set up slide itu. Uh, ada browse by uh, an individual window. Dia bagi saya choice power slide show dengan power point je. Sekarang macam mana? Okay. Oh dah dah dah. Okay. Full screen eh? Uh. Okay. Sekejap. Okay. Nak mula ke? Uh, sebentar ya. Sebab saya nak dapatkan dua screen, saya pakai uh, dua screen. Semua ni dah ni. Sebentar. Saya tak tahu. Okey, nampak full screen eh? Ah, bukan. <laughs> bukan. Ah, bukan ni. <laughs> Saya nampak full screen sini. Pelik eh. Ah, betul lah. Nampak full screen tak? Ah, tak. Tak juga. Tak, tak, tak full screen. Nampak skin ni nampak apa? Nampak, nampak note. Ah uh, PowerPoint nampak tapi pop yang biasa ni. Yes ya. Yeah. Tadi dah berjaya kan? Ni tak berjaya dah. <laughs> Astagfirullah masih. Sekarang macam mana? Sama tak? Ini yang sama juga. Pelik ah. Eh? Saya nampak kat sini full screen. Dekat Dekat share tu satu je ke? Saya ada screen, saya ada uh, option untuk window dengan entire screen So oh. entire screen lah Macam mana? Entire screen mudah, uh, mudah So lah nampak tu. nampak yang mana satu? Uh, yang Petronas lah? Ya, Nak Petronas lah? Ha, Petronas dia lah ya. Okay, jangan Apa sini? Oh, okay. Okay, okay macam mana? Nampak, nampak, nampak. Oh, full screen eh? Oh, nampak. nampak. Okay. Uh, full screen dah. Okay, great. Ya, yeah. uh, kita, kita. Okay, Assalamualaikum. Selamat pagi. Ada semua pelajar. Uh, so, kita akan mulakan sesi bersama dengan Engineer Karim Nizam Mak Tuhir daripada, daripada uh, Petronas. Okay, student kita galakkan untuk uh, open, apa tu? Uh, open uh, video lah, uh, turn on your video so that we can have the mirror session. 
Okay, at the end of the session, mungkin kita akan maybe we will have a question and a question and answer. Uh, so at the moment kita bagi serahkan kita punya majlis ni kepada uh, engineer Khairul Islam untuk uh, teruskan dia punya presentation. Terima kasih kepada guys. Okay, uh, terima kasih uh, Prof eh, Muhammad Fazli Ismail. Doktor je. Doktor, <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to UITM, especially uh, PM Dr. Bulan uh, for inviting me for uh, this session yeah, to share uh, with all the students. I've been informed uh, most of the students, right? the majority uh, final year student, uh, semester seven out of eight, correct? So there are about 200 participants today. Uh, that will participate of, for this Webex. Okay, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, IR, uh, TS, Dr. Karun Nizam bin Uh I'm 45 years uh, old this year, right? So I have about uh, 25 years of experience uh, working in industry since my graduation uh, from University of Technology Malaysia, UTM Skudai in 2001. Um, I'm so fortunate actually, so after about uh, six months, uh, graduated from UTM, then uh, I started my career in the industry, right? Uh, I hope uh, this session uh, will be fruitful. I will expect to have a two-way communication, means uh, I appreciate uh, those questions. Uh, from students, right? So as a young engineer, uh, because you will be uh, entered the real industry, right? After spend what four to five years uh, in UITM, uh, then I have been informed also. Uh, was I think all the students are from uh, Faculty of Mechanical, right? So that means uh, we are aligned. So I was also from a mechanical uh, engineering background from UTM before. Okay, so I will appreciate uh, questions uh, that uh, able to give you some uh, ideas, uh, assistance uh, on how you to craft your career uh, journey uh, after graduated from UITM later on. Okay, so I will start with my first uh, slide uh, introduction about my personal background. Yeah, so if you there are a few photos that give me a lot of uh, I think memories right uh, so if I, I refer back to my past uh, 24 years 30 years in my life right what have been achieved so far as of today okay uh, I I think uh, I spent uh, six years uh, my premier uh, primary school uh, in Serdang Selangor right so I was uh, study at uh, Sekolah Kebangsaan Serdang so during that period, this school is very famous uh, to supply uh, what the state uh, hockey players. Yeah? So not only for Selangor, but for Malaysia during that period. So the first uh, photos uh, taken in 19, if I could, uh, 1991 with my standard six yeah, uh, as a prefect for my primary school. So I'm here. Right, uh, as an assistant uh, head uh, prefect. Uh, during that uh, period, right, uh, I was actively involved, uh, uh, represented uh, Selangor uh, as a as state player, hockey player. I'm very grateful actually, so I would like to dedicate the majority of my uh, achievement in my career now to my lead uh, teacher, my English teacher, my coach. Uh, Late uh, Cikgu Rashidi, right, uh, Sofian. So oh, he was the one actually give me a very uh, high motivation. So Sekolah Wanzan Serdang is very, is considered not urban school. Um, so then he's passionate about hockey, uh, brought me uh, to where I am today. So this is uh, this photo taken. Uh, we are the champion. We were the champion uh, for the Selangor States. And also the third place uh, in uh, MSSM, Russian School uh, 
sekolah nak menjadi suka sekolah-sekolah Malaysia live during the period with my teammates eh. then I, I during that period the UPSR is still valid so I've got four A's then got uh, offered to sekolah alam Shah uh, Kuala Lumpur during that period still in Jalan Tentram Kuala Lumpur I think in 2003 uh, was moved to Putrajaya uh, prior to Sekolah Alam Shah, I was selected uh, to join a uh, special uh, sports school for hockey in uh, Sekolah Tunku Ampuan Rahimah, Kelang. Right? So I spent about two months there, uh, presented Selangor uh, and prepared for the national junior team. But I I noticed, right, so during that two months uh, start, uh, study in that school, my education, eh, my achievement in education dropped because my focus was too much to the hockey itself. Then, because as a uh, first uh, sibling in my family, I believe I have to give a good example, especially to for my other siblings. Then uh, I got offered uh, to enter school of Amsha. Then I made a decision to change uh, from that sp uh, school, uh, school uh, sport project to join Alam Shah, uh, starting from Form 1 uh, until SPM. So I spent about five years there in Alam Shah. Then now um, I'm married with one wife and three kids. Uh, my eldest son uh, in uh, Sekolah uh, Beras Mampun in Terkesi Gomba, in Tegom. So this year will be uh, his very important year uh, to attend for the SPM. Another two kids uh, are my daughters. Uh, still studying in Form 3 and uh, Form 1. So a little bit about my background, eh? as personal background. Okay, so before we go to the uh, my career background, personal background, uh, and also my professional background, I have a one short video um, I would like to share um, uh, with all, us here, all of us here. And we try to uh, learn something from this video. Eh? So I hope there will be a sound. If there's no sound, maybe someone can help me to uh, play the sound. Yeah? Are the sound? Tade. Tade, Tade. How to to share with the sound? Eh? Uh, doctor kata unshare, share balik semula, tapi share with the the other soal kat situ nak solve with the apa background ke apa. Okay, hold on eh. I'll share Sorry. with the computer audio. Oh, Kena tick tu. Kena Optimize tick. for motion and video. Ah, something dah. Kena share with computer audio ke show. Ah. Ada dua option je. Optimize for motion and video. That means ya. Yeah? Ah, tak, lepas and tu dia kena tick. Sebelah dia ada kena tick. Share Betul. computer audio. Dah tick dah? Ah, dah tick. Ah, okay. Ah. Then screen eh. Nampak my slide tak? Ada. Okay eh, full slide eh. Mm -hmm. Okay, kita try sekali lagi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ada. Ada sound? Tak, tak patah je kot. Tak ada juga? Ada muzik ke apa? Ada muzik kan? Tak ada, tak ada. Tak ada, tak ada sound lagi eh. <laughs> Macam mana ni? Saya dah stop sharing. Saya, saya ada dua option je. Optimize for motion and video. Tak ada option lain dah? Tak apa eh? Saya continue. Tak ada video eh. Tak ada audio. Tak ada eh. Tak ada masalah eh. Nampak screen eh? Nampak screen. Okay. So saya play without video lah eh. Tapi kita tengok je video ni.
Okay, simple video. But what we can learn from that video actually. So I would like to open to the floor actually, uh, from your perspective, what we can learn from that video. Anyone, any taken? Uh, I think yang last. Siapa Afik ya? Yes. Afik, ya, yeah, okay. Ada echo Afik, suara? Ah, uh, yes, saya yes, uh, yeah. co-host ya? Eh? Sebelah orang lain juga. Okay. Okay, so apa yang Afik boleh dapat daripada video tadi? Uh, I think the last chicken tu dia rasa rasa insecure, insecure um, tak confident tu tempat. Hmm, betul. Insecure, uh, not enough confident ya. Yeah. Okay, then about the rest, we have about three to four chickens eh uh, before the last chicken. Orang confident nak lompat. Confident nak lompat kan? Okay. Then kenapa yang the first group tu, the first uh, two or three chickens tu uh, have a good confidence compared to the last chicken? What do you think? Hmm, because orang ada orang ada pressure daripada <laughs> ayam belakang. Ayam belakang kan? The last chicken tu kan? Pressure. Pressure, yes. Okay, go try, go try, Afik. Anyone? Any different view from Afik? That it? Okay, so I think this is a simple video, but I will always share this uh, video uh, during our quality moment, HSA moment, before start uh, of our meeting. Yeah? So that become practice uh, to our meeting. We take about uh, two, three minutes eh, for every hour meeting just to share, right? Just to motivate the team. So not only just focusing into the content of the discussion, but we have to very uh, sensitive to our environment, the surroundings. Eh? Okay, what we can learn from that video? The first chicken, right? So we can uh, assume like a leader, right? So the leader supposed to have a good attitude good discipline and very uh i think high uh, clear focus actually want it to be achieved so for this uh challenge actually so the group of chicken would like to cross we call it a river but it's not really a river but there's obstacles uh in front of the chickens so for them to reach to another side uh of the area then they have to fly right they have to fly so we we are at with their skills actually, right? So first, for sure, the leader has show, need to show a good example, then need to have charisma, right? So, but before the leader uh, need to be equipped with all that uh, skills, so that's why we have to learn, right? To gain the knowledge and the skill experience. So that's what you are, you are doing now, right? You, uh, attached to the university, right? Uh, complete your uh, syllabus and study, right? Then only you can join the industry. Okay, so the process will take some time, right? So there's no shortcut actually for you to become a leader, right? Uh, and all of us actually will be the will have a same uh, career path, right? We start from bottom, then we start to grow once we gain the experience, exposure. Right, with the good coaching and uh, training provided by the uh, company or the industry, you're able to step up the ladder. So that becomes the first point as a leader, right? So now talking about the second, third chicken, right? So when they saw the leader already successful actually to cross uh, the obstacles and then able to be on the side of the area, so then there are another team members actually. So they gain some uh, confidence level oh if uh, our leader can cross the river successfully how about us so we just follow we just follow eh? uh, the same method the same technique we copy actually copy and paste but with some uh, confidence we try to overcome the challenges right so the second third chicken also uh, flew and crossed the river successfully but the last chicken Right, uh, so I think this is normal actually in industry, right? 
So we have a group of people uh, in the team members, uh, some with the high flyers, uh, some with the good uh, uh, leadership, right? So we have a uh, strength and weaknesses among the team. So that's a very important for the team members, especially the leader, to group and to ensure everyone is aligned, right? So we have to push uh, and support our team members just to ensure everybody will be able to achieve the same objective. Even though it will take some time for the last chicken to cross, right? But finally, right, I think with the commitment, uh, support, uh, and also the spirit uh, provided by the by the team, so the last chicken able to uh, make it success eh? uh, for to cross uh, the the river. Yeah, okay. I hope we give us some uh, uh, key takeaway actually uh, on how we relate this um, video with our uh, real life uh, challenges. Yeah, okay. We come to uh, next slide. Okay, so on my professional background, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, I completed my study, uh, my secondary school in uh, Alam Shah, Sekolah Alam Shah. Then I joined uh, UTM right uh, right after my SPM. So during that period, there's no uh, uh, foundation uh, program uh, for those who are joining. Uh, uh, the first degree uh, in UTM. I mean, that's a big challenge actually for those uh, from pure uh, science uh, stream to adapt to the new uh, environment, new culture, right? Uh, in UTM, uh, I found that's a very challenging uh, course, right? Uh, in UTM, so for record, so my cohort, I have about. 300 uh, students, right, joined together with myself. But by end of the study, so it took about uh, four and a half years uh, to complete my first degree. So only about 30 to 40 uh, students able to finish, uh, graduated successfully from UTM. So uh, the rest uh, have, I think, withdraw or suspended or have to extend their study due to the yeah different challenges right so but from my perspective uh, from pure science uh, student to take an engineering study especially on mechanical is very challenging but for those uh, coming from mrsm or technique uh, technical uh, schools i think they have uh, advantages actually so because uh, if i can recall correctly i think the Subject like say during the period, so AutoCAD, uh, technical drawing, static and dynamic, we don't have any uh, fundamental actually, right? Uh, to understand that subject uh, clearly, there's big challenges, right? Uh, but I myself managed uh, to graduate on time, right? But not on flying colors, right? Uh, then I felt very uh, unsatisfied actually with my performance in my first degree. That's why once uh, I graduated, I have successfully graduated in year 2001 and I made the decision. I, I, I believe in myself, I can do better actually. So that's why I pursue my study uh, in UPM into Master of uh, System and uh, Industrial and System Engineering. It took me four years. I, I did it part time uh, when I have started my career actually in industry. I graduated successfully for four years. Then I spent another six years after my graduation uh, from UPM to continue my career. Then during that period, uh, I believe um, we need to equip ourselves uh, with the professional certificates and also uh, recognition from the industry. That's why I made the decision uh, to register uh, with the BM, Board of Engineers Malaysia as a graduate engineer when I was graduated. Luckily, during that period, uh, because I I was attached uh, to the project management uh, company that managing uh, all the JKR projects. So I get uh, mingled around. I got the opportunity actually to mingle around with all the professional engineers from many disciplines, uh, such as uh, civil, electrical, mechanical, that uh, inspired me right uh, to 
uh, enhance uh, my professional uh, background. That's why I made the decision to register as a graduate engineer from with the BEM. Then it took about three to five years uh, before uh, I was uh, received uh, by board to continue uh, or to pursue my profession engineers, right? Uh, application. Uh, I got my first uh, PE in 2011 uh, in mechanical engineering. Then in 2014, um, I have upgraded to the PEPC. If you are aware uh, from BEM now, so there are two certifications. Uh, B, a PE is just a normal PE with the hexagon chop. But for PEPC, you need to attend uh, the examination before you're able to uh, certify as a PEPC. Professional engineer with practicing certificate means you are allowed to uh, provide the consultation. Right, you can uh, open up your business as a consultant. Right, in my case, uh, if I would like to open a consultation for in mechanical disciplines, uh, I have uh, certified with that. So I have successfully uh, did that in 2014. Uh, then I was registered actually during that period also with the IEM as a corporate member. And I continue to pursue actually my uh, professional uh, certification with the HRDF, the Human Resource Development Corporation. This is under Ministry of uh, Human Resources as a certified trained trainer. So I'm focusing into the uh, training material for quality tools, right? Uh, I will explain on how it relates uh, with this certification with my uh, professional journey, journey in the industry. Then once you being uh, accepted uh, as a professional engineer by BEM, you have a chance actually to uh, improve yourself. So I have registered as a certified ASEAN engineer uh, for mechanical discipline. That means we have to start from bottom, right? From scratch, then you can step up the ladder, then you know uh, people from industry, you create your own networking, Right, you have a good circle. Then everyone in that circle will approach. Okay, uh, what's your plan after this? What's your plan next and next? Right. So I've completed my uh, certification with BM and uh, Asian uh, Engineers certification. But during uh, PKP itself, right, during the uh, lockdown, uh, I took the opportunity to register myself as a professional technologist from MBOT. Malaysian Board of uh, Technologies Malaysia. And last year, I was uh, certified uh, as a lead auditor uh, from IRCA, uh, International Registered Certified Auditor. Uh, this is international body uh, for the quality management system for ISO 9001-2015, right? So that's a little bit of my professional background, uh, engaged uh, with all the certification body in Malaysia, right? Uh, I think before I forget, uh, last year also I have been appointed as a, one of the panel for EAC, Engineering Accredited Council. So I have to be part of the Engineering Council uh, representing uh, BEM to go to each uh, institution, uh, uh, all universities uh, to go through uh, the syllabus of the, uh, from each uh, discipline just to ensure it's aligned with uh, BEM, uh, and the uh, educational accord and also uh, from the industry perspective. So it gives me opportunity to meet up with the ac academia uh, students, right? Uh, to share my experience and knowledge uh, with all of uh, students and academia. I think I, I'm very grateful actually. So uh, with my busy schedule, but I'm able to provide some uh, social uh, support, right? Uh, to enhance or to uh, share my experience uh, with all the students uh, on how to have uh, to become a good uh, engineer actually uh, for future any questions before i move to the next slide that's all so anyone uh, aware about the bem uh, mbot irc ada tak benda-benda ni di share kan masa you punya kelas ada eh okay good that means you know lah let's say after you graduated uh, it's not only to focus on your 
uh, career path, but you have to uh, plan for your professional uh, uh, accreditation, yeah, just to have a balance, yeah, your career and also your professional background because it will support each other later on. Okay, if there's no question, uh, I move to the next slide. So, from my career path, right, uh, career background, um, it's not easy actually, uh, even though I said after six months, I graduated from UTM, uh, I only managed to get my first job uh, as, a, as an engineer, right, prior to that actually. So, I didn't uh, sit quietly, right, uh, waiting for the job uh, to arrive. Uh, I have applied during that period, there's no online application. So you you need to uh, rely heavily on the hard copy. That means you have to post all your applications. Yeah? During that period, there's no database, right? So you just uh, heard from your supervisors or from uh, lecturers, right? During that period, uh, which company uh, you can try to apply uh, your, your to send your CV and resume, right? Okay, so during that six months, right? During the six months after I graduated, uh, I did part-time with uh, UPM. I did a uh, part-time with UPM uh, as a part-timer, uh, managing a uh, scholarship and uh, loan application from uh, UPM students uh, attached uh, with uh, HEM, eh? oh, no, HEP, eh? HAL EWA Pelajar. Eh? Uh, managing the scholarship, then I have to deal a uh, lot with uh, PTPTN, JP, and another uh, sponsors, right? So what I learned actually, so even this part timer, very small uh, allowance, we call don't we didn't call that as a salary. So it's about three hundred or five hundred ringgit monthly, depends on your uh, hour spend. Okay, so but what I learned from that job actually, uh, I first. I got to know uh, the people. I learned uh, on how uh, the process uh, was set up uh, from the application, processing, uh, appeal, uh, up to the uh, award uh, of the scholarship or the loan uh, application to the students. Eh? Uh, I'm able to improve my communication skills, right? Uh, got to know people. Right, because you have to represent yourself. Yeah, you have to represent during that period. I represented UPM uh, to deal directly with officers from all the scholars. Uh, then I managed to uh, gain uh, uh, the good confidence on how to speak uh, officially with all the officers, uh, officials. Right, even the very short period, uh, but I really uh, appreciate that uh, time right, to work with them as a part timer. And during that period, uh, I'm trying hard actually to get my first job. And luckily, after six months, try uh, I have uh, accepted uh, to join uh, the company still available now in the worldwide thirteen section uh, worldwide business park uh, in section 13 Shalam. I think just nearby uh, your campus, just beside the uh, Federal Highway, the company called uh, NAS Progressive Consultants. Uh, it's a project management uh, consultant, uh, serve, uh, provided the service to JKR to uh, build, uh, to design and build and construct actually uh, the schools and also the uh, learning institution. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm happy actually. So even the very small company is a boomy company, uh, but uh, I got opportunity actually to mingle around, like I mentioned earlier, with all the professional engineers, right? During that period, or uh, give me some motivation uh, to enhance my career. If I didn't join them, I think I don't get opportunity. I don't get the awareness actually uh, to pursue for my professional engineers uh, certification yeah, with BEM. So I learned from them. I asked them uh, with all the senior people right, uh, on how to pursue and uh, what need to be uh, uh, supplied, what need to be attached in you know, my application. So one of the profit engineers supporting my application to BM right, uh, as a great engineer. And from that, 
I step up the ladder. Yeah, I spend less than a year uh, in NAS Progressive right? uh, as a mechanical engineer, but very big, very small uh, salary. Right during that period, is I think in 2001, 2002. Right, so as a young and fresh uh, engineer, you have no choice actually. So whatever offer you receive, you just take it first. Right to to provide you some uh, fundamental foundation before you can start to run right on your career. So I spent what less than a year, then I got another offer, you know, another small company called Autokin. I'm not pretty sure whether are you aware uh, the, the the what this company uh, Autokin. It's not auto clean, yeah. So some people will uh, be confused. Auto clean and auto clean. Auto clean is the uh, janitor, right? Uh, the cleaning company uh, that's providing the cleaning services to all condos and uh, commercial building, yeah. In auto clean, right? Uh, this is a metal stamping and assembly with some uh, small uh, plastic injection uh, scope, right? Uh, the company is new uh, when I joined them, right? Uh, about uh, less than 10 years when they have established this business, very small, uh, just supply the stamping parts, the metal stamping parts. Uh, I think in that period, the main customers uh, were Proton and Produa, right? So Autokin is a automotive vendors to uh, Proton and Produa during that period. I learned uh, to uh, prepare the quotation, uh, come up with the uh, MPP, the manufacturing plan, uh, 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 how to what uh, prepare and design for the die. Right? Uh, I'm not really sure whether this has been taught uh, in your syllabus. Right? Uh, mechanical. Uh, I think uh, metal stamping, plastic injection uh, is part of the manufacturing processes. It's supposed to be taught in your syllabus to give you some ideas. Eh? Uh, what's next, actually? What uh, industry uh, you can uh, get involved and participate uh, once you have graduated? Uh, I was uh, a product development engineer, right? Uh, responsible uh, to prepare the quotation and submit the RFQ uh, final tender bid uh, to Proton and Produa during that period, negotiate with the client on the final pricing, Right, uh, and managing uh, the project itself. Right, so once you have been awarded the project, then I, as a product development engineer, so I have to ensure the successfulness of the project, uh, the project uh, scope, uh, the inspection criteria, the assessment criteria. Uh, that was uh, that was taught. Right, uh, and I have learned a lot. Right, uh, to build my uh, character. Right. Um, uh, during that uh, period, then I got a chance actually. So that's why it's very important. Once you have a foundation, you start to build your network. So I work closely actually with Lotus, right? Uh, as a consultant during my tenure with Autokin. So Lotus is uh, one of our customers actually. So they have uh, uh, been appointed as a Proton consultant during that period. The project is a uh, proton wajah. Uh, then I couldn't recall uh, what uh, proton. Uh, the Wira replacement. So Gen two, yeah. So the first project uh, we did, we produce for proton is uh, for Gen two project. We supply for the OD assembly uh, module for proton. So Lotus uh, was a consultant. So I have a good relationship with uh, one of the engineers. Uh, from Lotus, then he offered me to join his team actually as a quality engineer uh, to manage uh, the metal body assembly uh, commodity from for Lotus. And I went for the interview. It's open interview, uh, walk-in interview. Uh, attended about I think about two thousand candidates in one of the hotels in KL. Then I thought the chance is very slim because you have to fight with another candidates, right? But Alhamdulillah, Rizki with me. So I got an offer from Lotus uh, as a supply quality engineer, focusing into the stamping uh, and body assembly parts. I spent about four years in Lotus. I grew up 
my career as a, from the uh, junior supply quality engineer up to the uh, lead quality engineer before I left uh, Lotus for the first time after four years. I moved to Sensata Technologies. Sensata Technologies uh, is part of the textile instruments uh, producing uh, sensors uh, for automotive industry. I'm not pretty sure whether uh, this company is uh, well known or recognized, uh, but it's a multinational company based in uh, states, uh, in the states. Uh, I went there for that for less than a year actually before I got uh, the offer uh, from Lotus, asked me to come back to join them as a principal uh, quality engineer right? uh, to support them uh, for new project, the joint venture in China uh, between Proton Lotus and uh, Young Men Group uh, from China. So we have to uh, localize uh, Proton Gen 2 uh, with the Young Men brand in China. So I was in, I've been relocated to China for two years in Jinhua, right? uh, part of uh, Hangzhou province. Yeah? It's about uh, four hours drive from Shanghai. Uh, it's a successful project because uh, that's the first uh, time uh, Proton uh, penetrated the market in China. We uh, have been appointed as a consultant and also a leader to the China team. Right? So we thought uh, we have transferred the technology, but after I think I was there since 2009 up to 2011, but now, now you can compare how the automotive industry in China now, how they beat all the uh, big giant uh, in the automotive industry, become a leader, right? Even though Tesla now we got number three and number three, uh, number two and number three, uh, losing end to the uh, BYD. Uh, as an EV uh, automotive uh, brand, right, worldwide. So it's a great opportunity to be based in China. Uh, deal a lot uh, with the international people uh, in China. A lot of challenges because uh, the most uh, challenging part is about the language. During that period, I think not uh, many of them, uh, the China men, able to speak English, and we have to heavily rely uh, with the translator. Okay, but I managed uh, to spend another four years in Lotus uh, before promoted uh, as a project manager. And the last uh, uh, project uh, that I was involved with Lotus and Proton uh, is for the Proton Suprema S, uh, the conversion of the Proton Privy uh, to be, uh, to, we changed it uh, to the hatchback uh, model. And before I got another offer. So if you realize, right, the first part of my career uh, as an intern uh, with UPM, then I moved uh, as a fresh engineer with the PMC company uh, for civil and construction. Right? Mechanical, uh, you don't limit your, actually, you don't limit your option uh, from mechanical background to especially focus on the factory itself. Right? So I think it's diversify. You have to diversify your options. Eh? Yeah, you have Maybe it's quite challenging to join as a fresh graduate to join big company, the big multinational company. But there, there is always a step, right, for you to start your foundation. So my first part of my career with UPM and Nash Progressive before I jump into the automotive industry. So in, in total, right, uh, from Autokin to uh, Lotus to Sensata, come back to Lotus. I spent about 11 years uh, in the automotive industry. Uh, then I realized actually after 11 years, uh, I couldn't uh, grow much actually in the industry. Uh, I was the project manager. I say the next uh, part of my career, if I want to jump uh, to become the general manager, but the choices, right? Uh, the offer provided by industry in the automotive is very limited. During that period, we only have Proton, we only have, uh, uh, Pro Dual and UMW Toyota. Uh, Dehasu is part of a uh, Pro Dual. UMW Toyota. UMW Toyota is part of Pro Dual also. So then I couldn't grow up uh, much, right? So then become. Uh, I realized uh, I have to change uh, my industry actually from automotive. I have to change my career path, right? Uh, then after eleven years uh, spent in the automotive industry, I moved to uh, oil and gas industry. Right. So what has brought me to the uh, oil and gas industry? So that actually that's my 
always my dream actually to join the oil and gas industry but the opportunity was not always with me actually so i try hard actually since 2005 after i joined lotus i sent a lot of application to join the oil and gas industry but i think because first rezeki right so it is not not for me yet but i was to try hard and eh, to believe on my uh capability i keep uh, enhancing my uh, professional uh, background certificate and so on always try right since 2005 then the opportunity came in 2011 right uh, when i got offer from eco solutions this is a norwegian company based in kl in intermark uh, but the manufacturing uh, office uh, is in uh, port klang right in pkfz port klang free zone so i asked actually the interviewer so what uh, have you uh, seen in my uh, my what uh, myself actually before you choose and pick me to join Eker. So I'm very fortunate actually. Uh, went in Lotus uh, and also engaged with Proton Project. Uh, I did a lot with uh, uh, Proton Project in the part of the project management team. So during that time, we apply uh, the project management tool called APQP, Advanced Product Quality Planning. It means there's a milestone uh, review, analysis, right? Uh, evaluation before from the front end engineering design stage, uh the pre uh, production uh, stage up to the execution stage there's a checklist uh, there's a lot of uh, project management uh, uh, engagement uh, with the team it's not only with the uh, engineering uh, construction manufacturing but with all the sub vendors so that skills right that i gain uh, from my uh, career in the automotive industry echo uh, saw this as a uh strengths right in my career yeah because during that period uh echo would like to introduce um, the project management tool called project Ex- execution module right so they would like to have uh, the m- milestone uh review uh, for every stage of the project development just to ensure before we move to the next stage everything has been uh, closed Uh, it's not uh, there's no carry over punch list uh, to the next stage that will jeopardize the final quality of the product or the services that we provided to the next uh, path eh? so they should uh, echoes saw this as one of my strengths that's why they have appointed me as a project quality manager uh, i got a chance actually to work uh, with a multinational uh, company uh i spent uh, seven years uh, in a solution managing uh total uh france eh, projects uh globally right so one of the biggest project that i manage uh, called combo so we have to produce uh, about 36 uh, christmas trees uh, so let's say if you have a question later on uh, what i mean mine uh, i meant by subsidy trees uh, the umbilical the subsidy control modules you can ask me later Uh, we managed uh, the project from Portland. We delivered to Angola successfully. Lot, uh, there are lots of uh, design uh, review, uh, production review, follow up, right? Uh, testing uh, up to the final acceptance test before the equipment, the subsea equipment, can be delivered to Angola, right? Uh, majority of my uh, time I spend. Uh, with uh, total uh, number of projects uh, and one project uh, with Petronas during that period they have uh, outsourced the project to Murphy Oil Corporation right uh, for the subsea division uh, called Siakap uh, not Spetai based in uh, Sabah uh, water uh, alhamdulillah i learned a lot right seven years uh, spent uh, with all the projects uh, with uh, the team members uh, all over the world uh, delivered the project successfully and after seven years in acre i got an offer from crown oil and gas this is a very small company uh, the company based uh, in netherlands uh, malaysia uh, business uh, i think uh, rely a lot with uh, petronas project sapura uh, bubadala and so on to supply the metering kits yeah uh for those uh, companies 
uh, I think the most uh, challenging part during that period, I have to manage uh, one project from Indonesia, deal directly with, uh, deal directly with uh, Pertamina. In I couldn't recall the place now, so I have to spend uh, every two weeks in Jakarta uh, to ensure the project uh, delivers successfully. It was delayed actually before my uh, time joined them. Then my task just to ensure uh, the project back on track, right? And delivered successfully. It was delayed about two years due to incompetence uh, of the personnel, uh, lack of uh, commercial issues, lack of understanding with the uh, our sub contractor in Indonesia, our representative in Indonesia. Right? It's not easy actually to deal with the Indonesian uh, people, uh, especially their government, their authorities, right? But give me a lot of uh, eye opener actually. So totally new environment. Uh, but the project is successfully delivered uh, for Pertamina. Uh, but I only spent about five months there, right? Before able to complete my confirmation, Technic FMC uh, called me to join them uh, to support uh, project uh, in China uh, with uh, CNOC, yeah, C on NOC. You can Google it later. Uh, one of the national oil company from uh, for China. The project called uh, Lihua, so I have to supply uh, 16 uh, Christmas tree with all the subsea production system based in China uh, for two years, but only managed to spend eight months uh, in China before I got another offer from subsea seven. I think that was happened uh, between 2019 and 2020, just before COVID. Yeah, so I'm grateful actually. So within a year. I got three offers actually from different companies, but in the same industry. I believe that's a rezeki and also, but uh, due to my uh, exposure with the international companies and also international projects. So the multinational company, I think will come to you actually to offer you the offer, the best offer, then you can make a choice, right? Then I spent four years in uh, sub seven, uh, based in KL, but managing project in, uh, Turkey in Istanbul, uh, UK and uh, Spain. Right, the last project I managed uh, was with the uh, Turkish uh, oil company TOC, uh, supplying all the subsea equipment. Uh, I spent about uh, two and a half years for that project. Then the final project before I left uh, was with uh, Shell Malaysia, Sarawak Shell Malaysia, called Rosemary Majaram. Then yeah, I said earlier, right? In, I apply hardly uh, to join the oil and gas in 2005. I think my last resort or destination uh, in oil and gas uh, is to join uh, Petronas, right? Uh, to serve the nation and with all my experiences uh, from automotive and all the multinational companies in oil and gas industry. I was offered uh, from Petronas uh, to join them uh, to manage the project as a project quality. Uh, just newly joined them for less than five months now. Um, I'm supposed to be based in Love One uh, for Petronas uh, Chemical Methanol Plant uh, to build a wastewater treatment plant. But I believe the exposures, the skill, experiences that I gained for the past 25 years uh, with industry is combination, yeah, uh, automotive and uh, oil and gas, give me a good confidence level, yeah, uh, to deal with all the multinational or international people. Uh, on how you to present yourself uh, in front of them, to give a uh, speech, a uh, presentation. I become my norm now, uh, even, even though very short notice. So that's why this is supposed to be taught in school. Uh, then you enhance your skill uh, in university, get involved in all the social uh, engagement, right, with industry, with uh, Internet, internal uh, event in the uh, university, right? Uh, to have the good confidence eh, when you have to speak up, right? So now the the challenge is not the same. If I return back to my earlier start, right, with industry, it's totally different game now, right? So the industry will require more and more actually demanded, right? The, the industry will become demanding uh, because I think. I would say also become demanding. We will ask for the best salary, right? What perks uh, the company can provide to us. Then company will also ask the same. If I 
pay you this such amount, what you can give back to us. That's why uh, as a young engineer, I just give you the rough uh, journey, right? Uh, give you some uh, knowledge uh, and uh, choices, right? Uh, what can be uh, selected later on uh, for you to craft uh, your journey. Maybe you can start to Google uh, the name of the company that I show it to you now. And then you can start to plan uh, for your career path. Right? Okay. So before I finish, right, uh, my presentation today. So a few uh, key takeaway uh, from my presentation today. I, I think we will, I will open to the floor later on for question and answer. Uh, first, we have to equip ourselves, right? First, academic, yeah, uh, is a ticket for you to join the industry. So I can see now from different view as a professional experience engineer, now become manager, uh, and also from uh, EAC panel, right? So what needs to be equipped with our students, right? Before they are able to join the industry. So first you need to have a good confidence level uh, on how you communicate uh, with the people actually from industry. Uh, I think the CV itself, uh, okay, you need, first you need to get the yeah, good points. Eh? Good pointer actually. So I, I I don't know detail actually. Maybe three pointer and above is the best. It's not. There's no guarantee actually. So even though you scored less than that, uh, less than three pointer, but there is always a uh, option for you to enhance to improve yourself. Like myself, right? I started low, but I covered during my uh, master's degree and PhD, right? Uh, to improve my academic uh, background. Then with the professional certificate, I covered again. Then by joining all the uh, multinational companies, it's completed my uh, professional uh, background, right? So you need to have that good confidence level. So I showed you, I shared you a few steps on how to build that uh, momentum. Okay. Uh, English is very important, right? Uh, it's not for us to speak with slang right uh, with all the style no the if you able to uh, convey your message right? uh, this is uh, straightforward actually you able to share your concerns right uh, in the right manner You're able to speak up correctly then it's good enough actually right then you can start to polish uh, by uh, having a lot of uh, reading materials don't uh, limit yourself to mechanical uh, engineering discipline itself you have to learn uh, other areas also i think uh, economics uh, politics right uh, geopolitics so that will help you to have more uh, topics right uh, to brief or to discuss uh, during your interview or during your presentation right so give you another uh, level of uh, exposure right Second, uh, always believe on yourself, right? Uh, you have to have a right circle, right? Uh, get the right mentor, uh, get the body system, right? So at this moment, I believe your lecturers uh, will support you, right? Uh, to give you some uh, guideline, uh, which industry, uh, which uh, discipline you can start to join, right? So always start to find a good uh, circle uh, and establish your network. So now we with uh, LinkedIn, right? Uh, you can start to uh, connect uh, with the industrial practitioner, right? Uh, to learn and connect uh, with them uh, to understand what's the challenges in the industry. Okay. Then uh, I mentioned earlier on the CV, right? Uh, I always receive numbers of CVs, right? So what I will spot is on the presentation of the CV, the content of the CV, on how you structure your CV, right? Uh, give the highlights, right? The summary of your strengths, right? Your what you can contribute to the industry uh, with a simple manner, but to have a directly uh, spotlight in your strengths, right? So because it's very difficult actually for me just to filter, right? So I will say, okay, the key points. Let's say for you to become the certified quality engineer, 
So numbers of uh, certification like CC 3.1, 3.4, right? Uh, for you to be certified, uh, the NIS uh, qualification. There's all the additional uh, certification that will bring uh, additional value to your CV, right? Uh, if you're talking about your CGP alone, I think it's not uh, sufficient to compete with others. So you always have to think on how to uh, become the spotlight uh, from all the CVs, right? So then you have to work uh, a lot on that, on how to craft your CV uh, to gain uh, attention uh, from the recruiter. Uh. Okay, then once you, you join the industry, don't stop your journey to uh, improve yourself, especially with the, all the professional certification, uh, academia, even though people said uh, with the first degree is enough actually for you to step up the ladder. If you have a chance uh, to pursue your study uh, with a master's degree and up to the PhD, just continue, right? Uh, industry will appreciate, right? So they will appreciate uh, those with the high qualification to join the industry. Then we will bring, uh, give back to the academia uh, on what have been learned in the industry to ensure there's alignment, right? Uh, to and fro, actually, uh, from these two uh, disciplines to bring, uh, to improve our industry, right? Uh, for our young generation, especially for the young engineers. Huh? Okay, so with that, I open uh, to the floor uh, for the questions. Any questions? So what should I do? Uh, student can ask the question directly or you can type into the chat box. Uh, doctor boleh check dengan chat box juga. Ada soalan dah tu. Okay. Ada satu soalan ni. From Muhammad Zakri Ashraf. How can I improve myself in terms of connection with others in working environment? Work environment, yeah? Uh, first, you have to get connected right, uh, to the right people in the industry. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, now we have a LinkedIn, right? then you can start to connect uh, yourself. That's a professional uh, network. Uh, you can review uh, the background of the industrial practitioner right? Uh, from the education background, the working experiences. Then you can have some ideas right, on how to uh, craft your uh, career path, yeah, working journey, right? By ha uh, having a connection with the industrial practitioners. Eh? Okay. Ada satu soalan je. Soalan lain tak ada ke? Sudah, saya tanya. Ada satu jam lagi. clear. I hope I uh, have shared uh, my experience, the working journey uh, to give you some ideas and uh, motivate you eh, on how to start your career path eh, in, in the engineering. Okay. Ada soalan lagi. Thank you, sir. Then how to solve incompetence in workplace, especially from higher ups? How to solve incompetency in workplace? Eh? It depends, right? So it's back to yourself. Let's say if you know, you need to have a, you have to perform the gap analysis, right? If you thought you have some lacking in some areas, as in the project management. In project management, I think uh, it's a fun, basic uh, fundamental project management uh, uh, was uh, taught in university, right? But by involved directly in the uh, industry, you have a real challenge yeah, on how to deal with the environment, uh, the pressure from the stakeholders, right? So by having the gap analysis, uh, later on, I think the, the HR actually uh, will have the TNA, the training analysis every year. Then there's a job description, uh, the expectation from your uh, job grade, right? What need to be delivered. And then from that, the training analysis will provide you the gap uh, assessment. Then you have to close the gap by attending the training. 
uh, the seminar, the workshop, right? Uh, uh, On-job training and so on. Uh, but as a personal, you should know better yourself. I see if you are lacking in terms of the soft skill, uh, how to speak up in front of uh, people, then you have to improve yourself uh, by attending the course. Eh? And also always train yourself in front of mirror, uh, improve, uh, I think the, I think the what? You rasa apa? Susah nak bercakap depan orang ramai kan? Uh, the pressure tu. So, but always uh, uh, get the chance right? uh, to take, uh, to be part of the uh, team, uh, to deliver the speech, right? Uh, attend a lot of uh, social uh, activities, uh, right? Uh, macam engage with the third party uh, to have a workshop in, in the company and we give you a uh, confidence level eh, to improve or uh, to reduce your nervousness actually once you have to stand up from the people okay so i hope i answer the question on how to improve the incompetence eh, uh, from the top management yeah okay next question if i get the chance to become a manager but for an education center, will I able to get a good position if I'm going to continue my work as an engineer? If I get a chance to become manager, but for, oh, in education, will I able to get a good position if I'm going to continue my work as an engineer? Okay, to be uh, a good engineer, you have to work in industry, right? Uh, work in industry, you will uh, get a lot of experiences. That's a real challenge. Eh? Uh, engineer why we are hired because we have to solve the problem right uh, the problem is uh, in the real field right so that means if you are transferring your discipline uh, from academia then become uh, engineer you have to uh, step up the ladder from bottom actually right there's no shortcut actually if you have uh, i'm not really sure uh, this is the real example uh, of 25 years in the industry from this, I don't see any uh, academia when join uh, industry uh, always automatically be at the top. So they always have to start from bottom uh, to gain all the knowledge experiences, right? So that's why as a young engineer, uh, the real challenge will be in the real field. So you have to become the engineer, then you can start to craft yourself. Then later you can give back to academia because you have the real skill, the experience exposure, then you can share back with the uh, academy uh, uh, disciplines yeah okay next question how to deal with uh, toxic teammates environment <laughs> i believe this not being uh, taught in uh, school right uh this always come back to ourselves actually so we have a choice actually to choose our circle our friend our clique right so let's say if you think the teammates is uh, toxic right uh, it's not help you to uh, grow uh, in the industry, you have always a uh, choice not to join that uh, group, right? So please choose your right circle from the beginning to support you because we need to have a, a good support system to always motivate us. It's not easy actually to always uh, wake up in the morning to come to work to deliver the job, right? So we need to motivate ourselves. So you have a right choice to choose your uh, own teammate and working clicks yeah okay next question uh, as a project engineer what are the challenges that as engineer we usually face and how to adapt with uh, such environment okay project engineer is a quite uh, challenging role uh, because a project engineer we always uh, connect with the project manager uh, in terms of schedule cost and quality so we call it CQD, cost, quality, and delivery. Uh, cost is very important. We don't want to burst the cost. How to not to burst the cost so the project has to deliver on time. Then how to deliver the project on time. So there is always a alternative, actually, the option for us to monitor the progress of the project deliverables uh, on daily basis. So like what I'm doing now, so we have a stand-up daily meeting. We call it daily meeting stand-up, uh, half an hour. 
some company we call it as a stand up uh, toolbox talk right just to ensure we are aligned uh, every morning before we start the work what's the expectation then what's the challenges for us to deliver on that day so we don't wait uh, until a uh, weekly meeting or monthly meeting to discuss the challenges right so we have to work closely with our team uh, monitor the progress uh, closely and come up with the solutions uh, within that half an hour right so if we th uh, we thought the half an hour session is not sufficient then we have to uh, have another ad hoc uh, meeting then for the young engineers right so meeting uh, in industry is a norm so but for us to have an effective meeting um, from my past experience uh, 45 minutes to one hour is the effective if you drag your meeting more than that i think it's not effective anymore then you have to reschedule it means uh, you have to come prepared uh, during the meeting you know what to brief and the uh, support required and the expectation uh, from your uh, view uh, to improve uh, the delivery or the deliverables of the projects. Yeah? So that's a normal challenge yeah? uh, as a project engineer in the industry. That's why you have to work uh, closely with your team members. You can't work alone. Uh, this is very important to have a good attitude, discipline, uh, charisma, right? And to guide the people and to have support from the team members. Right, so it's very important to have a uh, alignment with the with the team members eh, to deliver the the task. Okay. Next question: If I join a startup or SME company before I'm NC company, how to avoid myself to being seen as a betrayal and stay the networking with the startup company after they get multiple training and certification that paid by the startup engineering company before joining the MNC company? uh i was in this situation i don't see myself uh, as a betray right so we are all professional before you left the company i think based on the contract or based on the letter of what there's always uh the resignation or a period right so as a professional you have to uh, put your tender notice i see a month notice or three months notice right so that's normal so you don't uh, feel you are better after you have attended few training certification from that startup company uh, to grow yourself right the choice is always with you right uh, then the opportunity not always uh, for you right then you have to make uh, choices if you have equipped yourself with a good certification uh, to support your grow in industry and continue your journey right don't feel uh as a betrayer right so that's a norm right then but you have to follow the professionalism the act uh in your contract on how to uh put your tender or resignation right uh properly yeah right please remember so don't make enemy with your uh past employer right you don't know uh the networking the people that you have worked earlier you're going to meet up again in the future if you uh left them right uh with the negative uh feedback right you don't know what's happening in the future so people will start talking about you then the the chances for you to grow is will be very slim so that always uh remember to have a good uh relationship if you have to tender tender properly respect the contract eh? but don't uh feel you become a better just a norm okay next question how would you recommend handling a situation where an individual finds themselves working under leadership that incompetence okay now i think uh most of the companies uh, focusing into the sustainability uh, will be part of the objective uh, or the companies right and one of the pillars and also the values uh, to the company uh, you always have a avenue right uh, in terms of uh, speak up right this way if you feel your leader is incompetence or grievances right you always can uh, report or highlight your concern uh, to this channel right but this come with the integrity let's say if you have a personal fight then you feel unsatisfied uh, with your leader without any evidence you made a false complaint then there's always setback yeah the consequences on yourself 
but uh before we come to that uh channel right so i always uh have a session actually with my leaders uh, because we will have a 360 review every six months uh, and for annual performance review. I, if we think it's uh, too late uh, to wait for that session, then always uh, plan for the face-to-face -face, uh, discussion, right? Uh, to what convey uh, your unsatisfactions eh, uh, towards the leadership. And but this has to be done uh, in professionally uh, manner, eh, professional manner. You have to come with all the evidences, right? Your uh, supporting evidence, uh, do just to sh to prove your claim, right? Uh, then, if from the session you couldn't, uh, it couldn't meet your objective or your expectation, then it's up to you to speak up and uh, highlight your concern into the grievances channel. Uh, up to the uh, top management level eh? okay next i heard that it is hard to join into oil and gas industries especially if you have no connection uh, oil and gas background as someone who have an experience on changing from automotive to oil and gas industry what is your opinion yeah i feel it's hard actually but i don't believe on uh, on the connection because i have a lot of friends uh, working in petronas uh, when i started my career I asked them to share my CV, right, uh, uh, to their uh, companies, right? Uh, but the response was not so good, right? So that's why I said I applied since 2005 to join Petronas, but only successfully joined them only this year. It took me about how many years? What, 20 years actually, before I can close my deal with Petronas. So the connection will be an added advantage. But I think from my experience, let's say if you have tried hard, then if the opportunity is not uh, come to you yet, don't give up. Don't give up. Always uh, try to improve yourself, right? Uh, in my case, I have spent 11 years in the uh, automotive industry before change uh, to oil and gas. The skills, right, um, will be similar, but sometimes uh, it become the essential skills. Because uh, let's say when I joined uh, Acre Solution for oil and gas, they saw the skill as a, in the project management is uh, is new in Acre, but it always matched in automotive industry. Then I saw this advantages, and then I used that as strength to penetrate the oil and gas industry. So that's why it's very important for you to always uh, polish your skills, right? You don't know when are you going to use it, right? So then, then don't limit yourself. Don't uh, uh, put your options limited. Uh, always polish your skill. Uh, keep joining the uh, what uh, training, uh, workshop, uh, talk to the people, uh, create the networking. Then you will, hopefully you will find uh, your right destination later on uh, in your career paths. Okay. Next, being a leader, it is common to have worries and stress. How do you handle it? Have a clear mind and keep calm. I learned this a lot, right, actually. Uh, after 25 years experience uh, in the industry, pressure is always there, right? Whether this a uh, high pressure or middle, medium pressure or low pressure, right? The pressure is always there every day, right? Then what, when you join a uh, project, it's always a QCD, yeah? quality, cost, and delivery. I'm not pretty sure whether you're aware. What does it mean by quality itself, right? People always keep uh, talking, uh, we have to deliver quality, quality. What is quality all about? Quality is about the meeting requirements, right? Before you're able to meet the requirements, you need to understand the contract. You need to understand the requirement, the project specs, right? Uh, the international regulation, uh, Malaysian local authorities regulations. Then uh, from that knowledge, right, with your skills, uh, experiences, exposure, you able to uh, digest, right, all the pressure. So sometimes you have to filter the pressure, right? Then you have to prioritize. You have to prioritize the pressure, whether this is the first pressure, the first level of pressure, second level of pressure, then how to ensure there's no uh, implication to the next uh, process. I say if you're not able to deliver the first pressure, you're not able to handle the first pressure, then what's the consequences? What's the next? So maybe you're not, you're not able to adapt the pressure, 
then the impact you're not able to deliver your job. Then that's why you have to focus on that first pressure. And then in the meantime, you have numbers of pressures. But this need to be prioritized uh, for you to focus, keep focus, and always uh, take a one step back, right? Before you react to that pressure, right? So don't uh, make a decision when you're not ready. But the decision uh, must uh, based on all this uh, what uh, review, right? That's why you need to have a good team members. You need to have the knowledge, right? Uh, experiences uh, and also the ref references before you can able to make a good decision. So always prioritize the pressure, right? Stay calm, take one step back before you come to the situation. Then always consult with your team members. So I will believe the decision uh, is a mutual agreement actually. It's not based on your personal uh, commitment or your personal interest to make your decision, but you need to get support for your team members. Yeah? So then as a Muslim actually, so we have to come back to Allah, right? Uh, you have perform your five uh, days, uh, five times prayer a day, right? Uh, and if you have, if you are married, actually, so always uh, get the motivation, support from your wife or from your husband later on. So that's your partner, actually, right? Your partner to share everything, to always motivate you, right? So that's why you have to balance uh, your career, your work life, personal life, right? Then I think it will. Uh, once you enter the industry, uh, you able to. Uh, judge for that, uh, understand the pressure and how to deal with that. Yeah. But the fundamental is always uh, uh, one step back before you make a decision. Okay. So I believe that's the last question. Yeah. So that's all the chit chat from the chit chat. So I would like to hear from the floor itself. Right. So previously on from Afik on the comment meets on the video. So the rest. Kita kena confidence lah. Okay, tanya, angkat tanya soalan, uh, face to face. Uh, bagi you some uh, confidence lah. Uh, how to throw your question uh, in public. Boleh tak I dengar soalan-soalan daripada students lah. You are final year student. Just one semester before become the uh, fresh engineer. Come on, nak dengar suara. Boleh? Jangan malu-malu, boleh tanya. Clear. Hello. Hello, hello. Eh, boleh dengar suara saya? Ah, boleh. Ahmad Nur. Boleh cakap kuat sikit tak dengar? Dia sayup-sayup je kat belakang. Actually, saya punya speaker ni pun uh, bagus tapi saya cuba untuk kuatkan suara lah. Ah, okay. Better. Okay, actually um, saya ada satu soalan lah. Hmm. Uh, okay, I believe um, majority student yang join this session sekarang already have their target sectors which is yang drive them to apply for their internship lah hmm. and actually uh, I, uh, saya adalah one of the uh, one of those minus maybe yang still like uh, tak tahu like terkebil-kebil what what I gonna do with my degree um, in this mechanical engineering kan. Like, to be honest, uh, I already have uh, macam targets lah nak pergi sektor mana, sektor mana kan. Tapi, I think it's maybe because of lack of competency and then uh, the confidence also. Uh, like, uh, maybe like uh, sometimes there is, uh, I'm questioning myself lah. Macam, um, layak, layak or not like, to become an engineer or something. So like, mm. we have opinions for those who are still stuck with those thoughts. Mm. Kenapa rasa lack of confidence? Uh, Took off your apa, pointer ke? You rasa you tak boleh bercakap depan orang ramai ke? Apa yang you rasa lack of confidence tu? Um, apa honest, sebabkan you rasa you kurang confident tu? Kurang keyakinan uh, diri? Apa yang buatkan eh, apa yang hmm. buatkan korang confidence tu maybe like the fear to face people itself lah kot. Like, takut jumpa orang. You uh, takut jumpa like, orang. Uh, takut jumpa orang, takut orang judge like 
Okay. 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 Uh, pointer okay? Amat Noh? Pointer so far atas tiga but still is not uh, macam sufficient lah. Ya yeah, rasa, you rasa tak cukup lah eh. Ya rasa tak cukup lah. Okay. It's normal, it's normal actually. So as a young graduate, lagi-lagi sekarang ni very high demanding uh, industry, right? Kalau kalau you nak join orang gas ni pun uh, as a intern, uh, as a fresh, uh, ya yeah, kita banyak choices kan sekarang kan. Industri pun banyak choices from all industries, ada from overseas, from local kan. Then kita tengok point to itself pun, uh, it's not a guarantee actually for you to be uh, joining us, right? Macam tu kan. Tapi tak apa, right? Uh, first, you know, macam mana nak build that confidence level eh? So that's what I mentioned earlier, kalau you ada opportunity to join the apa outside or external uh, activity uh, in university kan, macam mingle around, uh, macam you kena organize uh, uh, training ke workshop ke, yeah, you have to get participate actively actually, bukan jadi apa uh, sleeping partner lah. Mana kalau you jadi komiti, uh, you kena understand uh, your scope, right? Kita rasa benda tu kecil, tapi bila you dah biasa buat benda tu, you have a confidence to talk with the people, especially uh, with the strangers, right? Macam mana to start the conversation? And what topic need to be discussed? How to throw your ideas? That's why uh, kalau you start to communicate with people with different uh, background, right? Don't limit yourself. Uh, kawan dengan uh, mechanical engineering student saja right kalau you involve in sports right you akan katakan myself i play hockey kan up to the national junior team so i ada ramai kawan from different background right uh, then different topic yang kita akan discuss macam mana how to deal with different level of uh, uh, mindset kan then from that plus with the uh, apa involvement dengan all the social activities, right? Ambil chance uh, to participate or to present, right? Uh, uh, actively, then they can slowly improve yourself. Kalau I share you satu experience, eh? my first uh, interview with the small company with the testing lab for Proton subsidiaries, right? I was asked to uh, convey my uh, conversation yeah, uh, in English. The interviewer check up. I think you just stop uh, speaking English, better uh, continue with Malay lah kan kita. I cakap, weh, macam mana that kind of feedback uh, I receive from the interview right? Tapi it uh, doesn't stop me there actually. So I I took that as challenge right? So it's, I know it's not easy or it's very difficult actually to change. Let's say for, let's say kalau somebody with the introvert punya personality to become extrovert. Uh, macam mana nak to uh, convey your ideas right? then lagi-lagi kena speak in English uh, during interview uh, macam mana nak gain confidence kan sebab you ada very limited time during kata masa interview one hour kan a lot of pressure, a lot of questions then you kena fikir dengan you punya nervousness semua kan tapi you kena start from bottom lah right? Uh, get mingle around with your kawan-kawan cari yang from different background Then let's say you boleh join uh, sports ke, ada social activity, recreational club ke, then ada activities uh, outside university, right? You dah semua dah pergi internship uh, ni kan? Uh, apa industrial training kan? Belum lagi. Oh Sebab belum lagi. Dalam, dalam bulan tujuh akan datang ya. Oh macam, next, next semester ni. Ah uh, ya. Yeah. Okay. Tu, like, uh, saya ada mention tadi yang macam most of the students yang join hari ni like uh, actually feel inspired juga lah. But by this session so hmm. yeah. okay tapi mana by bulan tujuh then uh, join uh, placement lepas tu graduate lah um, dan uh, in, intern dulu bulan tujuh ni bulan tujuh sampai September around hmm. 10 weeks and then akan masuk balik uh, for last semester and then baru graduate okay then for placement 10 weeks about 3 months lah kan yeah. 3 months lah actually tak cukup lah actually kan untuk belajar tapi tak takpelah I dulu pun 3 bulan Uh, different industry uh, buat bus eh chassis bus uh, mingle around uh, network dengan all Bangladeshi right kita buat kawan je semua macam dia yang buat pekerja tu kan dia buat welding dia buat foaming untuk dia punya seat right so that's why we have to come uh, to the ground actually eh uh, mingle around with the people eh different background you gain ideas actually so let's say as engineer 
you need to know from scratch usually so you need to master the process then it's good for you to work closely with the uh stuff uh, the ground stuff eh? then from there you can build your character lah right okay so itu je mano eh so means uh, kena bercampur lah uh, start to bercampur dengan kawan-kawan uh, dari different uh, disciplines and nilah uh, actively involve in the activity lah macam mana untuk gain your confidence lah later you masuk uh, internship later Jangan uh, limit yourself okay, buat printing, buat kopi kan. You kena demand actually. Uh, what's your scope? Like kata you buat untuk procurement. You have to learn uh, the procurement process kan. Uh, from bidding, RFQ, uh, contract uh, review kan. To award. Uh, you kena master on that within three months tu lah. Right? Mana you dah clear, uh, uh, ada clear objective from beginning. Then you kena keep to that uh, objective lah. Hope answer your question eh. Amano. Okay. Ada soalan lagi? Tadi tadi ada orang kat tangan lagi. Ada dekat chat ke? Okay. Ada kat chat sebentar. Okay, from Nur Alia eh. Kalau pointer sikit tapi extra curricular banyak macam join activity persatuan, handle program banyak chances to be hired to tinggi tak? Uh, dia always depends uh, macam mana you perform your performance during interview, right? So like I mentioned, the degree as a ticket for you to be shortlisted for the interview, right? But once during the interview, uh, the interviewer, like myself, I'm always a be in the interview. Uh, I always see, like we do ice breaking, eh? uh, just tanya, can you uh, tell us about your personal background, uh, your family, and what's your objective in your uh, life? Yeah, it was ice breaking, your soalan. Kalau soalan yang pertama pun dah tergagap-gagap kan, rasa berpeluh-peluh kan, macam uh, then memang akan selalunya uh, the chances, eh, the successful rate uh, to be hired very uh, slim lah. Eh. So, tapi macam mana you nak perform well during interview, means, okay, mana first part, pointer you kata walaupun sikit, tapi you diterima untuk masuk uh, interview ni, mana you dah pass first stage. So second stage on the interview, right? So macam mana untuk you have a good confidence uh, to perform well during your interview session? That's why it's very important you equip yourself not only for the interview. That means from now, right? From now, uh, that means now you get a chance. In July, you're going to have an internship. You have to equip yourself with the real industry challenges, the expectation of the industry. Kalau you master on that area, then if you apply for the same position uh, after your internship or after your graduation, then you have some ideas to throw or to convey and to discuss during interview. Kan? Normally, macam interviewer ni, kita suka provoke kan? bagi satu scenario. Okay, if you are in this situation, uh, you are alone, uh, this is the pressure from the stakeholder, the requirement, uh, you have to make a decision within this sort of time or period. Uh, what step? Uh, you will take just to ensure there's no impact on your decision. Kita tanya macam tu. You might tak sempat berfikir pun tanya. Tapi macam mana you nak rasa benda tu akan ada automatically it based on your uh, apa? conversation every day, your exposure that you have it every day. That's why you have to read a lot. Not only focusing into your discipline itself, mechanical engineering. You kena faham other uh, discipline juga. Right. Then kita nak you mati talented means uh, kalau kita suruh cerita pasal politik, you able to answer. Then what's your opinion on that? You able because you know the the content, then you able to uh, extract and you boleh convey your ideas and right. So tapi kalau you join macam mana extra activity ni, and it can help you to build your character. So you dah biasa uh, mingle around with the people and manage your program. And then we'll build your character lah during the interview to yourself, right? Okay. Harap menjawab soalan eh untuk Nur Alia tadi. Okay, ada soalan lain from the floor. Itu saja. Nampaknya macam tu je kot. Itu saja. Uh, okay. Ada soalan lain ke boleh tanya live student? 
Ah uh, last question lah. Ah. Uh, Saya nak tanya last minute. Boleh, boleh kan? Dia daripada siapa? Ahmad Noor. Ah ya. Ahmad Noor okey. Okey, um it's so much controversial punya question lah sikit. Hmm. Ya, macam mana like uh, kita nak kita ni as uh, fresh grad kita nak deal with skeptical thinking daripada M eh, daripada company-company lah as in um, from where kita graduated pun actually that one uh, kind of influence the adjustment jugalah untuk asset kita untuk masuk dalam company kan hmm. so macam in term in, 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 even dalam interview pun uh, macam Uh, question untuk uh, orang daripada sini the lain daripada orang yang question uh, institution ni so hmm. uh, uh, soalan saya macam mana kita nak deal with the skeptical thinking ni lah ok kita actually it's difficult for us to control other people punya perception right tapi I don't believe uh, previously memang I thought oh kita from I graduated from local universities eh, from UTM and UPM So I feel sometimes a very lack of confidence right to compete uh, with other graduates yeah especially from overseas lah lepas tu overseas pun top ranking universities right uh, I'm not a fl- high flying uh, uh, student right during my uh, secondary school even though uh, from Alam Shah kan tapi I always uh, show my Uh, but I see, always see myself, right? So my friends yang uh, continue uh, in overseas, right? Coming back, so start to build their punya career with the uh, apa, big MNC company, right? Sometimes kita rasa feel very demotivated, very uh, lack of confidence, kan? Uh, tapi it's not true at all, eh? Uh, macam industri pun actually bila kita filter the application from uh, students right? uh, from the young engineers yeah, yeah, kita tengok first qualification okay dan tak tengok industri mana pun right? katakan kalau dia kata from imperial college you know, itu wah wow, zoom kan ada spotlight kan tapi tengoklah dia punya qualifications uh, pointer lepas tu dia punya uh, apa uh, exposure yang dia dapat dalam masa study kan Uh, benda tu very subjective actually so depends on the uh, committee lah tapi from my perspective from my end uh, from wherever university kan tapi you meet the minimum requirement let's say untuk become the engineer you need to uh, you need to uh, certified with the mechanical engineering degree katakan then you first step you dah ada so from which university is a bonus point lah right tapi kita tak akan ada that kind of uh, biasness lah right so then hello dengar tak ha dengar tak ah okay so then bila you dah dapat the opportunity masa interview tu you yang kena uh, perform well lah you have to come prepared lah so other candidates kadang-kadang uh, we take this uh, lightly uh, we take this lightly during interview uh, kita rasa dah dah first dapat uh, opportunity to attend for the interview dah rasa first uh, milestone kita dah achieve then for the interview kita tak akan prepared right kita rasa uh, lebih kurang saja kan tapi benda-benda ni kalau you uh, come prepared benda uh, then you were able to convey your apa ideas in the interview then your chances to get hired is very high lah actually right so penting macam mana you Uh, sell yourself during the interview itself right then before you able to sell your idea you have to come prepared lah uh, macam mana you uh, dapat all the inputs right uh, on the industry background the challenges let's say if there's any issues on how to deal with it uh, benda-benda datang from your readings uh, from your conversation uh, kalau you baca from google itself pun dia tak banyak membantu right so mungkin you tengok video youtube apa macam the background uh, industry punya demand sekarang kan uh, buat networking uh, engage with the professional kan ah uh, boleh tanya i ada few uh, apa uh, inilah uh, young engineer last time bila dia graduated dia approach myself i tak kenal pun dia kenal kat linkedin dia kata okay uh, so can i have your time uh, we can have a chit chat uh, how how to craft my uh, career path right 
then luckily now a few dah success dah jadi professional engineers uh, have a good uh, position in the industry and then i'm happy with that lah actually so that means kita jangan rasa rendah diri tu sangatlah eh rasa you rasa from local uh, university you rasa you tak boleh compete come on kita pun top 200 in malaysia kan uh, out of 30000 university in the world so jangan rasa rendah diri right kita malaysian kita have to be proud with our education system and we have to believe in ourselves right so put your trust in your uh, lecturers right then yeah lah Uh, deliver well uh, if you get a chance to attend for the interview tu saja eh sembahyang jangan tinggal uh, doa mak ibu bapa penting dan buat baik pada semua orang lah eh tu saja okey terima kasih sama-sama okey uh, i think we come to the end of the session uh, i would like to thank uh, again uh, to UITM uh, from Faculty of uh, Mechanical Engineering to give me a chance opportunity to share my experiences uh, professional background and so on i hope with this uh, sharing uh, we give you some ideas uh, uh, what's need to be next uh, in your career path right so in case you have any other questions eh, uh, please visit my linkedin lah you can drop your questions in my chat room lah right You can find myself lah, uh, Kairul Nizam Mat Tohid. Eh? Itu saja. I return back to the host. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, ucapan terima kasih kepada uh, Dr. Kairul Nizam uh, dan ucapan terima kasih sekali lagi kerana sudi uh, mengetahui kita punya uh, sesi pagi ini. So, uh, bagi saya fikir pihak ya, UITM, kita berasa sangat berbangga uh, sebab dapat uh, input yang baik, uh, sharing session yang baik daripada uh, doktor. Kemudian uh, daripada pihak pelajar, pihak pelajar saya harap pelajar dapat input yang baik uh, untuk bersedia menghadapi uh, satu cabaran dalam kerjaya macam-macam insya Allah. Insya itu saya ucap terima kasih. Sekian terima kasih. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Sama. Uh, pelajar uh, boleh sama ada nak keluar daripada room ni ataupun nak remain. Kita akan jumpa balik pukul 2. Ya pelajar? Bye doktor. Okay. Bye. Bye.